um, the um, methodological part, you know, fundamental ontology and the idea of transcendental phenomenology and the working out of the method into um, the second movement, if you will, of the, um, of the text and one way of reading it. And um, we're going to begin with the uh, existential analytic. Um, I was looking at the text. I think the best thing we can do going forward is to um, maybe next uh, next time read the sections uh, 14. I think I marked it down somewhere. Anyway, I, I don't. Um, we could read uh, sections um, 14 up until. Um, um, pages 63 through 89, 90, up to the fundaments for the ontological definition of the world. So this would be sections 14 through 19, in which he takes on the Cartesian uh, cogito, um, the I think I am, the great the phrase of uh, Descartes, the cogito, um, ergo, which is from the Greek ergon, which means you're working through something. So therefore means it's been actually worked through. It's an, an active work. It's an active connector. Uh, so, and uh, you know, Heidegger's position will be in terms of the design analytic or the existential analytic that we're going to be engaging is that you know the, the problem with the, the Cartesian moment is not so much that we think or that we are. The problem is he doesn't deal with both. That there are two verbs at work here. I exist. And I think, <laughs> and the thinking being is not talked about. So we're going to go over that with some some uh, rigor uh, next week. You know, in, in terms of the um, the uh, 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 the advent of, uh, of, of of getting into world and worldhood and spatiality uh, before we go into the questions of the subject, the who is speaking, what is the who, the what, the being in, the self, and the they self. So that'll be two weeks away. We'll talk about the dictatorship of the they self. We'll be getting more into some of the, you know, more directly political, but at the same time, mm -hmm. things that I think are, I mean, at least uh, ideas that are very relevant for today, you know, and, and especially with the media, digital divide, et cetera. How is this new dictatorship of the they self happening, you know? And uh, some of you may be familiar with the, the sociologist David Reisman. The Lonely Crowd, he distinguished between uh, two types of personalities. One is the inner directed, that it comes from within, people that know where they're going, they have some kind of inner <laughs> life, etc., versus the external directed, always being directed from the outside. And this is obviously a, a take up of Heidegger's they self. And that, the dictatorship of the day. Yeah, please. Yeah. Now that found its way into popular psychology. Or, uh, yes. When I was in graduate school. Right. Or Julian Roder at the University Julian of Julian Roder, and, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Reisman was a uh, professor of a, a person I knew from Mississippi who left the United States in 72, never to come back. She's still living in France, but she gave the commencement address at Sarah Lawrence, and which was a scathing indictment of U.S. imperialism. And she was also one of the founders, if you remember, the Peace and Freedom Party. Yeah, Carla, Carla Hefner was her name. And there was a book written about her family called Why the Hefners Left Mississippi. Their houses were burned. They were very active in black freedom struggles, and the, the, the KKK would burn their, burn their house as well as every place that they went to live. And they really had to actually leave the state. It was so brutal. Yeah. So it'll give you an idea of, yes, this, this, this was violence on the other side. It just didn't start with uh, Black Lives Matter. Or, you know, it's been going on a very long time, even with the so-called civil society that we live in. All right. So, um, so today, yes, this, this marks a kind of uh, um, a moment in, in Heidegger. How are we going to go to now this this um, Dasein? And again, uh, this, by the way, is this, uh, from 16, uh, 18 to sixteen twenty nine. That comes up with this around sixteen twenty seven to twenty eight. Uh, the discourse on the method. That's the first time this is used. I think therefore I exist, right? 
which is the foundational moment of the sciences. Because he's looking for the epistemological base, right, to go back to this, you know, point of foundational ontology, you know, versus that of the fundamental. And it's the method, it's not a method, the method of Cartesianism. And for those of you that are going to be in Stanley's class later, you know, Adorno will make a commentary on the Cartesian positivism vis-a-vis -vis the dialectic. You know, there will be a section on that in the uh, introduction to dialectics. What's that? What? The Adorno is amazing. Yes, it is. The yeah. first chapter was easy, sort of, but then by the third chapter, you're already in trouble. Like, it's <laughs> yeah. And you notice how, we, how, how much we spent on medical issues today, or causality, and a lot of stuff that's far afield I mean, of what it's actually you know, doing. Like, yeah, no, it's, 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 which is the whole point. Thought that cannot be recodified. This is his point. This is what a writing is a political practice for him. Yeah. Always, always a political practice in what you write. It's not about making it easier, it's about making it harder, and that which the system cannot reappropriate for its own. This is why it is so difficult. Yeah, and, and you know, and needless to say, even though Kant was a bourgeois philosopher, Fichte to a degree was a bourgeois philosopher, Hegel was a bourgeois, these are all people that are very interested in revolution, <laughs> you know, and they're not, they're not sitting around idly, you know, saying we like the status quo. So there is this, also this kind of new language that is producing new concepts, you know, that's, that's going on. Yeah, and this is part of dialectics, yeah. And we'll, you know, we'll, and we'll you know, talk about that vis-a-vis -vis Heidegger as we get further into this. So anyway, so we've been over the hermeneutical ontology, this is going to come, come back, the transcendental phenomenology and the epochs. Um, again, remember, he is still trying to, to engage what has been very trivialized in history, which is this question of being, which is the most universal, right, and emptiest of concepts. How do we get back to the meaning of being into this ontological state of affairs, right? And how do we ultimately, you know, begin to think this through the ontic back to the ontological? Yep. How, how is this going to happen? So um, anyway, um, so let me let me do this. I wanted to do this today just to give you one um, uh, a sense of some of these things. I, I did a little diagram. <laughs> um, yeah. So I did a diagram. So we're, we're beginning the di what is really called the existential analytic. Right? Today. And it is only through us that we can actually interrogate uh, the being, right? The indefinable, the self evident, and the most universal. And, you know, the idea here is to make more explicit what we're both vaguely feeling, right? We're trying to get back to something that, you know, we don't really experience at some levels, right? We're trying to get, that's why it's still vague and bewildering, befuddling, etc. So there's this, the experiential realm gives us this vagueness, but there's something else going on. So anyway, you have what, what would be called uh, the object of the inquiry. Um, being, capitalized, dying, and finally the entity, or the sign, uh, des, this is the German, so I'm using entity, we could use being, you know, in, in a way, so the type of inquiry is the first thing, the object of inquiry would be its type, right, and can it be ontological, or is it ontic? So this will give you an idea of how Heidegger's working between registers, right? Then you have terms of inquiry, right? And this is basically through the existentials, right? Where we're going to begin today, right? Or moving towards this, but we're going to get this through both categories, right? On the other. So the ontic, the categories. 
then the status of occurrence um, in an inquiry how many times does it come what is its status the one is and we didn't really talk about this with the Adorno but he's certainly aware of it the factical or what is called you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, facticity in some ways versus the factual, right? So you have these differences, right, between the ontic, the ontological, the existential, the categories, the factical and the factual, and then finally um, the types of self-awareness. So you have basically four things here: the type of inquiry whether it is ontological or ontic, and he's gonna move between that, with this always in mind, the question of being and the mean of being. The ontic through us, right? Dasein, in the world Dasein, right? The, the terms, the existentials at a higher level, right? And then the categories. And then the t status, is it a factical, right? In other words, is it part of historical facticity versus the factual, just the givens of everyday, you know, experience, if you will. And then the, uh, the uh, types of self-awareness, and this would fall into two, two types, the existential and the existential, right? existential, right? And I think I distinguished between that earlier. You should have that in your notes about the types of self-awareness. So. so this is also, if you say, we begin here again in all public type. Can I chair over there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah don't twist well. Okay, yeah. The old uh, Can't do the twist. revolving uh, neck uh, doesn't yeah, work. Right. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Not so well. All right. So I, I want you, I mean, I hope you can keep this in mind as we go forward because this is going to be very, very, very important. Um, you know, to kind of read it in multiple registers. It is through the ontic that we're going to begin. Now, I'm going I'm to I'm gonna go to the text, but first of all, I wanted to give a general uh, sense again. So. You're going to see that he's going to, you know, kind of uh, say that anthropology, biology, if you remember mm -hmm. this, and psychology are not the disciplines that we're going to find the ontological, right? They are very much ontical disciplines, right? So he takes on what is the Leben, right? <laughs> and Leben's philosophy, very much. He also takes on... Um, the biology, you know, through life, yeah. The psychology through that the psyche is not, quote, an existential, right? <laughs> Part of the psychology from which it comes from. And then anthropology, the study of primitive speaker, uh, peoples, does not also constitute fundamental ontology, okay? So these are disciplines. If you want to think of it this way, Descartes did a nice tree in a letter to Pichot, a friend of his, around 1630. And he says, this is the way the disciplines work. You have the trunk of the tree, which is physics, the laws of motion of nature in the, that study. Underneath this are the roots, metaphysics, at the roots, right? <laughs> right? Then the trunk and the rest are mere branches of knowledge. You know, that was one image in which, you know, and this is what, uh, you know, your friends uh, Deleuze and Guattari, <laughs> oh, the uh, rhizome. Yeah, the rhizome are trying to go beyond that of just the roots, right? <laughs> right? So the, the rhizome or the rhizome is something that they are going to, you know, use as a different foundational moment in French philosophy, right? right? So, but... For Heidegger, once again, it's the fundamentals, the fundamental ontology, which is the stake here in terms of reawakening and retracing uh, the question of being and also, of course, the meaning of being. 
And we have to keep this in mind throughout, right? This is always still about that, particularly the meaning of being. And who gives that meaning? It is only through us, we ourselves, the subjects, right, of this. Okay. So, um, so section ten um, you know, of this se section nine begins the theme, right, in, in division one, beginning on page forty-one. That the being whose analysis our task is is always we ourselves. The being of this being is always mine. And when he uses the word mine, this is appropriate. We're going to talk about this as well, vis-a-vis -vis the notion of authenticity, mindness, eigenmike, <laughs> eigenmichtigkeit <laughs> is known as what is proper to one's own, right? What one effectively, authentically appropriates, makes one's own. And this, of course, created quite a stir because, you know, Adorno says this was a jargon in his book. I mean, I want to point these things out just to keep in the spirit of the dialectic, you know, or at least a, a dialectic among, you know, conflicting ideas and interpretations of the real and of, of being, that Adorno said that this, this was a kind of jargon, right? And this was very popular in terms of looking at, at authenticity both as something very real and worth striving for, but at the same time, part of the me generation of the 70s, for those of us old enough to remember this, that somehow the me generation took over from the collective generation of the 60s, right? Remember the, the me generation, the moi, right? Yeah, for me, all self-interest. So you the begin, c'est moi. The I <laughs> yeah, and then the I, well now we have iPhone and iPad and I, I, I do this and, and you too, me, you know, et cetera, right? <laughs> to all our friends out there. Anyway, this, this is a word and, and going back, I mean, I have a thought about this in disease um, I always thought that, you know, one could really do a very good study of disease from a, both a dialectical and fundamental um, ontolo ontological uh, thing, both through being, history, and, you know, dialectical, all in one, if you will. Um, you know, the hermeneutic and the, and the genealogical and the dialectic. By talking about the inauthenticity of biochemistry, you know, the how, how, how the biochemical, you know, Cancer, in some ways, may be about the inauthentic, you know, mm -hmm. existence, and it translates into biochemistry. If you want to take, again, this whole approach, right? I mean, I'm just saying, uh, this is not very speculative on my part. I mean, I have no idea of what the scientific evidence, you know, uh, you know would look like. But it seems to me that people that are living really in the realm of possibility, right, and stay in that realm most of their lives are much less prone to devastating illnesses, right, <laughs> and defeating illnesses. I'm not saying it's 100% the case, but it seems to me if one is living in that <laughs> innermost possibility, as Heidegger will talk about later, that one is, you know, the same thing in terms of the quote unquote, I don't believe in this term at all, but mental illness, mental disorder, psychiatric, you know, all these kind of things. Again, in some ways it becomes a response, an inauthentic response to the situation or to the world. And most therapy is going to treat this as neurosis, right? Childhood trauma. I'm, I'm not saying you leave that out, but it seems to me a more valuable approach at this time is again to look at the underlying choices that one makes, right? <laughs> In, the, in, in particular times in order to find out where maybe that inauthenticity went, uh, you know, or how this occurred. I'm, just, I'm just very much speculating here, riffing off of Heidegger's language. But I, it's not a bad, you know, and there's a very good book called Existential Psychotherapy by a man named Urban Yalom, who really tries to bring choice back into, you know, one's, <laughs> you know, life, right? One's, one's uh, life and, and, you know, the choose to be, quote unquote, close to one's possibility. And it seems to me that what's derailed, yeah, that yeah, yeah, go ahead, I'm, I'm listening. Are you saying that choice can alter biochemistry? I'm saying that, uh, that uh, an authentic response to a situation, yes, that sometimes if one is living in a neurotic 
relationship to certain situations in one's life, it can actually break down the immune system, you know, mm -hmm. that there's a connection between psyche and soma in this way, right? Okay, yeah. but, but it, w would you take it further and say choices you make lead to something like cancer? Um, well, not No, I mean, not yeah, like I'm not telling smoking. you to go smoke or get no. you know, I did a lot of that in my day. But like Stanley said, keeping being inward or... Yeah, I mean, what, what happens, it seems to me, is that you're really dealing with a, a kind of categories here of ressentiment to in the situation, a Nietzschean uh, uh, moment, as well as you, you're actually flying, you're in flight from who you are you know, to go back to the Greeks, because Heidegger is very much in conversation with destiny, <laughs> you know, fate, these kind of terms, you know, I'm just saying that he's doing this, I'm not saying we need this language, but, but anyway, the, um, uh, yes, the, this is an, the inauthentic response is to flight, the flight from anxiety, right, when one is really making a choice, when one makes existential choices or life choices, one is in flight, you know, if one chooses a path, you know, that wasn't really them. That's Nietzsche. You know? Yes, it's Nietzsche too, yes. And Heidegger, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now Nietzsche has tremendous influence on all, all of this, obviously, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, amor fate would be another thing. You have to love the facts. You know, going to fatum, fatum here, instead of saying fati, right, and more fatum is the love of all that there is, you know, in, in one's existence, right? This is another thing, too, that you love the factical or the facticity. You embrace it and then you work with it. I'm, I'm just extending here. I mean, I'm just, you know, working on... Nietzsche yeah. went mad. <laughs> I didn't say he had to live it. He wrote it. <laughs> well, so did Heidegger. Heidegger yeah. was in the, in the hospital, too. Yeah. Yeah, he was. He was. He was institutionalized right. too. Yeah. Well, I don't yeah. know if he was, when he was young. Or? No, yeah. no, no. In 1949, around the yeah. time mm -hmm. he was having all the conflicts with the Nazi purification committee and yeah, Re recertification. And he also uh, stuck, maybe they took up another. No, and then he took up <laughs> <up> another <laughs> uh, relationship <laughs> with another uh, um, young <laughs> student, <laughs> which didn't help his family life either. So between uh -huh. between the two of them. Um, he ended up uh, in a very nice institution, it sounds like. This. <laughs> <laughs> the Germans are good at this. No, no, the director would go on walks with him. And, you know, yes, well, that was a matter of boss, his friend. Yeah. yeah. That was his friend. Yeah. I who, began, yes. who began, yeah, I mean, this is the thing, design analysis, right? Uh -huh. Instead of psychoanalysis, uh -huh. you had design analysis. That's interesting. The analysis of being here. <laughs> <laughs> and he said you were being okay. here. Yes, right. And they had exercise, they, they had sessions on the ski slopes. <laughs> <laughs> we're so backward, man. We're so barbaric. <laughs> so barbaric. <laughs> barbaric. Animal was too good a word that Koja had used. <laughs> when Elliot went to uh, the asylum in uh, Germany or Switzerland, I forget. T.S. Elliot? And he, he quotes it in the wasteland, I go to the mountains, there you feel free. Yes. <laughs> I said, Marie, <laughs> Marie, <laughs> hold on tight. Yeah, hold on tight. <laughs> right, right, down, I know, right? I hear you. <laughs> yes, yeah. So anyway, um, just to, you know, to broaden this a little bit, we'll, we'll come back to this. I mean, I have a kind of, that people that are really living out there, you know, possibilities, right, seem to be more immune to these kind of life-threatening, you know, terminal diseases early on in their lives. I mean, I, listen, I mean, when Stanley talks, I mean, Ellen was very depressed for many years, and, you know, and then she got lung cancer, you know? Yep, in some ways. I mean, you know, I, I know. I mean, I I can think of a lot of people that I've known over my in my my uh, life that have had severe, you know, battles, right, in terms of life choices and and situations, and then somehow something takes them over, like a cancer or a, you know. Yeah, probably smoking didn't do anything for her. No, that's true. She never smoked, though. Ellen Willis never no. smoked. No. Uh, no, yeah. since she had lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Did Stanley? Stanley never smoked. Either. Did he? Yeah. 
You know, it's interesting. My uh, <coughs> my dad's this interesting yeah. oncologist that who retired. He yeah. was philosophical. He said, and I think he was kind of paraphrasing Adorno, maybe unconsciously. Maybe he wrote it. You know, he maybe he read it. I mean, he said that cancer can be thought of in at least two different ways. One is it's sort of like a contradiction within the body, like yes. within being. Too much life. Well, it's it's in too much life, ways. but it's yeah. also the yeah. the, 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 the sort of nature's guarantee that this life will end. Yeah. Right. So in other words, if you live long, if you live long enough, right. you will develop a cancer at a certain level. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he says that's one thing. But on the other hand, it can also be the product of our own actions. You know, stress, right. smoking, yeah. in a horrible diet. Mm -hmm. Right. And he says then the medical intervention also adds another dimension to it. Right. You know. So it's sort of like these. It's like the the dialectic right. between you and yourself, but also within yourself there is something that yeah. can either go this way yeah. or that way. You know? uh, right. But I, I want us to keep this, this proposition in mind that I threw out earlier, that's a Kantian proposition, because Heidegger's very much there. He's really thinking about possibility being higher than actuality. And unless one lives in this, you know, tension, I always have to be in touch with my possibility, right? as a human being, as a Dasein in the world, right, being, I will, you know, hopefully have fulfillment, satisfaction, you know, some gratification in my life. If I'm away from that possibility, in a sense, I become prone, more praying to the falling, you know, that I mentioned earlier, the verfallen, you know, to the addictogenic, to these kind of things, you know, this is, I think, where he's, uh, where he may be going here, and maybe what we can do with it. Because again, you know, we're, as Stiegler says, you know, we need to have, you know, uh, an economy of contribution, which I would add to that is an economy of care, right? And, you know, you can build on Heidegger. This is something, to me, that's really lacking in an anti Oedipus even though descriptively and phenomenologically it's a masterpiece on schizophrenia and on capitalism and its contribution to schizophrenia. It's also a masterpiece in terms of uh, its critique of psychoanalysis in, in many ways. However, what it doesn't give you is a new structure of care. How do you really go beyond, you know, where we are? So in some ways, I, I read, I mean, I'm, again, personally and my, my own interpretation is that you can extract from this some kind of new economy of care, you know, or care as a therapeutic community would have it in a very different way where you would be talking about language of possibility, not language of adaptation, not the language of uh, conformism, not the language of coping, you know, these kind of things. This is, this is where I'm trying to go. I'm sorry? Those would all be ontic. Uh, that they would be uh, very much ontic and also be subjected to the dictatorship of the they. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Because again, you know, it's being as process, if you will. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, um, so you, you, you probably saw here, so going back to the text itself, as the, as the being of this being is entrusted to its own being, it is being about which this being is concerned, and from this characteristic, two things follow. And I want to make a comment. The essence of this being lies in its to be. Okay? So essence does not, again, vasen, this is on page 41 of the second edition. Yep, 41. Chapter 1, uh, Section 9, the theme of the analytic of design. Vaisen, once again, has a very becoming aspect to it. It is not fixed as, a, as we say, an essential or something leading to essentialism. It can become a category as an essence at one level, as a noun, but actually as a verb, it's still in the process of being and becoming. Right? So it must be understood in terms of its being, existentia, insofar as one can speak of it at all. Here the ontological task is to precisely show that when we choose the word existence for the being of this being, the term does not and cannot have the ontological meaning of the traditional expression of existentia. existentia. According to this tradition, existentia ontological means being present. Warhanden, a kind of being which is essentially 
inappropriate to characterize the bee which has this character of Dizon. We can avoid confusion by always using the interpretive expression objective presence for the term existentia and by the attributing existence, existence as a determination being to Zazan. Okay? So he's beginning to make these distinctions between being present, the presence, and also the attributes of existence only that we see in ourselves, Dasein. The essence lies in its existence. The characteristics are not just not presence attributes of an objectively present being which has such and such an outward appearance, but rather, and this is important, possible ways for it to be and all, only this. All being one way or another of this being is primarily being. Thus the term design which we will use to de designate this being does not express in what, as in the case of table, house, tree, 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 but rather being itself. Right? Being capitalized, Zion. The being, which this being is concerned about in its being, is always my own. Okay? It is only proper to me. Right? This is not me. Right? It's not part of me. This is a oneness. Right? We're talking about a oneness, and we're also talking about um, the, um, the, the question of possibility. Right? This has a means and possibility. It has means of employment, right? But it doesn't have an innermost possibility. You know, you can throw it, you can use it as a weapon, you can, you know, do all kinds of things, right? Okay? So, anyway, then he's going to talk about, this is interesting, Zazan is never to be understood as a case or an instance of a genus. So he's going against genus differentia in the old way of categorizing things and the way the scientific community takes up a lot of its uh, methodology, right? Yeah? Right? Ob objectively present. To something objectively present, its being is a matter of indifference. More precisely, it is in such a way that its being can neither be indifferent nor non-indifferent to it in accordance with the character of always being my own being. When we speak of design, we must always use the personal pronoun with whatever we say I am, you are. Okay? So, this is going back to the Descartes, you know, situation. We're also... Is that interesting footnote on yeah. the top. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Heidegger's own little, like a little cross yeah. 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 thing, mm -hmm. symbol. It says, that is, mindness means being appropriated. Yes. By, by myself. Yes. Yes. Yeah. By the possibility. Which is a very radical By thing. the possibility. I, yes. I can appropriate myself. Yes. Always. Well, think of it this way. By the possibility, when we talked about futural, you know, we talked about that this is really about future and future anxiety as well. The appropriation is of that possibility. Which is the which is on starting fundamental point for starting the point. Or, or the, the fundamental starting point for what's called the existential analytic. Yeah. Like the, the hermeneutical, I mean, you spoke about the appropriation when yes. you went through hermeneutics, like. Yes. Right? The yes, one of, the, one of the types of, of the, the hermeneutical, yes. Yeah. That's your interpretive thing. That's right. how you, these are the tools, if you will, you or your tool kit of interpretation. Right. Going back to this. So, Dasein is my own to be always in this or that way. What are you into? <laughs> Which way are you going? It has somehow always already decided in which design is already my own, right? The being which is concerned in its being about its being is related to its being as its own most possibility. What is your own most possibility? Once again, you know, you can put a lot of therapists out of business if you get in touch with your own most possibility. <laughs> work with it, right? I mean, you know, again, to go back to what I said earlier, this fear, this flight from anxiety, flight from self, if you want to use that kind of vocabulary, the flight from self, right? And something that we have really forgot about completely because now everything is in the machine. You know, it's all machinaic, right? You know, yeah. I'll Google it, right? I'll, I'll do this instead. I can't use my own most possibilities of really doing research, you know, etc. Anyway, 
So <laughs> it can choose itself and its being and its possibility, and it can lose itself, or it can never and only apparently win itself. It can only have lost itself, and it can only not yet have gained itself because it is essentially possible as authentic. That is, it belongs to itself. The two kinds of being, the modes of being, I think mode would have been better, of authenticity, so he uses this language for the first time, the mode of authenticity, eigenlichkeit, and inauthenticity, un, eigenlichkeit. These expressions are terminologically chosen in the strictest sense of the word, again. So this is a crucial passage because he's introducing these two terms that got him very much into trouble. Right? <laughs> with Adorno, uh, with Pierre Bourdieu, and others, right? Uh, very, very, you know, much so. Yeah. Uh, are based on the fact that Dasein, in general, is in general determined by always being mine. It belongs to no one else. So this, of course, is totally anti-slavery. You know, in some in, in some ways, it's actually, you know, it's, it actually is a kind of givenness of a free subject in some ways, right? That has that freedom to move, right? In some some senses, we, we you know we can talk more about. It. But the inauthenticity of design does not signify a lesser being or a lower degree of being. Rather, and this is interesting, inauthenticity can determine design even in its fullest. Concretion, when it is busy, everybody on the go, excited, overexcited, overenthusiastic, interested, and capable of pleasure. Right? These are some of the things, right? Yeah, yeah. That can determine it when you're overdetermined by these kind of, you know, uh, moments, right? Uh, yeah. Busyness for Heidegger is not a good thing. Being busyness, <laughs> right? Praxis is important, but not busyness. Busyness for him is a cover-up. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Totally against nine to five. <laughs> totally against all the work. <laughs> you know, when you say, I'm busy, I don't have time. Yeah. <laughs> right? I gotta work. I gotta work. I'm busy. <laughs> I gotta go. Yeah. Right? What all of these things for him are, you know, yeah. What about capable of pleasure, though? I mean, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's interesting. interesting. I mean, maybe he's talking about, um, you know, um, um, a kind of inauthentic capacity. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what he really means here. It's hard to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know. If he enjoyed skiing, I mean. We enjoyed uh, uh, young uh, Jewish women, too, <laughs> right? Sure. And I emphasize the but Jewish not with on him. this one, too. <laughs> yeah, right. Not skiing with him. Right, right. Yeah. Please. Sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah. When I looked up the word uh, inauthentic self, I think it was the philosophical definition that said the forfeiture of one's individual meaning, destiny, and lifespan in favor of an escapist immersion yeah. in the public everyday world. Yeah, the flight. You, you're, okay. you're allowing yourself to be dictated to right. by the public, by the they self. Right. You're, you're directed by the busyness. The boss says you've got to be here at 9 o'clock short. Right. Okay. You punch the clock. You know, remember this is 27 when he's writing this, but we still see this all the time. The home office. True. I'm busy right now. I've got the, you know, this going, going on. Okay. You know, so yeah, see, that, that, that's absolutely correct okay. in, in many ways. A uh, good, good, uh, good definition of the inauthentic uh, self. Okay. Or what we could call a marginal self as well, mm -hmm. and not in the Derridian sense of the marginal, but the marginal that you're outside without that full encounter with dread. Because at the bottom of all of this, as we know, is angst, is anxiety. Mm -hmm. We're fleeing anxiety of being towards death. Yeah, that's where the resistance is. You know, the resistance like is toward Kafka, uh, the metamorphosis, Gregor Samsa. Is a man that works very hard and does exactly Look what happened what to him, Chris. <laughs> and he wakes up one morning and he's a giant cockroach. No, it's a vermin. The best translation Not is vermin. No, no, no. I, I like vermin better. It, it you, gets more to the. I, I you like cockroach better? Cockroach. He's got a shell on it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, okay. He's got many, okay. many legs. Okay. <laughs> and he can't get out of bed with all his little legs. Yes, yeah, true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> when he's on his back, he can't get over it. Yeah. He can't. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. That's so that's my translation. No, that's good. That's okay. No, no, it's been used. It's a New Yorker. It's a New York translation. Yeah, I see. New Orleans, we've got plenty of cockroaches. Oh, I'll bet. You can imagine the cockroaches. Ones. Big ones. Yeah. That's why I've discovered Harris Roach tablets, one of the great inventions of all time. Control the cockroaches. Save many books. From cockroaches, had them all over the place. Poison, poison, poison. It's rid of the cockroaches quickly. So <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. 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 No, like organic, yeah. Yeah. Like any other. No, no organic. Friendly. Forget it. Yeah. Save the books. You know, take the smell. <laughs> I'd rather save the books. Than, you know, for, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. but yeah, no, it's a good example. Gregor Samsa is someone, and also even in Kafka's terms, before the law, this door is for you. Is an avoidance of that door before the law, that section, which has been commentated, I mean, done excellent commentary by Derrida and the Derridians on Kafka's parable before the law, which is from the trial. Someone must have framed up Joseph K. Where, where in Derrida uh, the comment done? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get it for you. I'll, yeah, it's in, the, it's in one of the collections, but it was published first as an essay. <coughs> yeah, I think it's in Glyph one of the uh, uh, glyph uh, journals many years ago. Um, but anyway, very interesting that you have this inauthentic response by Joseph K, who's actually framed up for something he doesn't do, but he can't face his own anxiety before the law, right? Cannot enter that door. I mean, this is interesting in terms of the existential, which, you know, we're speaking about here. Right. The authentic so, authenticity or the inauthenticity. Does that mean that the Bukharan, when he was on trial, and he he's an authentic is com completely, yeah. completely, <laughs> completely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, no, he's a terrorized by death. Here's a man who puts his life on the line, you know, 20 years earlier, you know, as a real leader, you know, and then he capitulates to a party line to a very regressed dialectic, you know. I mean, you know, I'm very ambivalent about he should have Uncle resisted. Joe, but he yes, should have he could have and resisted. With all the consequences. Yes, then you go with the consequences. So several people did, yeah, in some ways. And then you think of, of you think of the great uh, Hungarian uh, uh, Politzer, the philosopher. I mean, he used to laugh. He was interrogated by the Nazis for nine months, and he would just laugh in their face every time they wanted names or they wanted hideouts in in, in Vichy. Yeah, yeah. They offered to say yeah. he Yeah, yeah, yeah. They said, up. you give us names, we'll let you go. You can go back and even teach, they told him. Yeah. Yeah. So someone who was giving, you know, the, the party members, the working class party members, lectures on materialist philosophy, you know, underground in Vichy, who's captured by the Gestapo, you know, tortured, interrogated for nine months, wouldn't give him, they finally killed him. And there are many stuff. Mark Block, you know, you can go through all this. For this, you know, this is a very, you know, uh, yeah. So I mean, it's not an accident that this is being written. You know, this is in Va late Weimar. Remember, we're only six years away from, you know, and, and, and you know, was pointed out here. That Heidegger had some relationship to the SA, not to the SS, mm -hmm. right? Oh, on Right. The left of the well, they were, yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. I know you. I know you want to make them a left, but uh, I don't, I, it, it, that's a big stretch. Making. I uh, saw David. David's therapeutic eyes went up. Brow went up. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm just thinking of the essay and you know what. No, it does keep popping up, and, and the yeah. other thing I'm reading and. and you know, trying to place the night of the long knives and yes. when they were eradicated, but it seems like Heidegger still, you know, was was looking towards the essay. But I, but I gotta say this about the essay because I was reading about them too a little bit. That there's a there was a, a lot to be said about it. No, but there was a tension between the, the people who were wiped out in the lot left who had this kind of confused. A lot of them started in the, in the Social Democratic Party, yeah. right? But right. They had this confused idea that once we took care of the you know the um, the state, and we're we in the state, right? We overthrew the liberal state. Now it's time to go, to go after the capitalists, right? In that sense, so there's kind of a misguided kind of understanding. They perceived themselves as sort of leftists, you know, and in that faction, you know. Yeah, but they, well, they were in a sense. I mean, and in a sense, they were, and right. that's that's why they were killed in the night of the long knives. In that sense, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That's when he says National Socialism does not live up to its, the inner greatness of the movement. Right. <laughs> and that's the Another proposition of his, too. Goebbels went to the He was other supposed side. to leave, yes. for, but then in order that's not to correct. get killed, he that's went correct. to the other side. Yeah, yeah. But remember, the stakes here are enormous. I mean, still are, but I mean, you think about the enormity of the stakes here and what these people, when we sit around talking about Hegel's master, the lordship uh, bondage uh, relationship and the risk of one's life. I mean, these were people who were both thinkers and, and revolutionaries. I mean, you know, in di differing degrees. I mean, this is a conservative revolutionary in many ways because the conservative aspect of it is, is that he has this kind of, what I, I would consider, what I would call a restorative nostalgia, you know, for the Greeks, right? He has a restorative nostalgia. Yeah. It is only through that way that we will begin to find our way once again towards this, you know, possibility of, you know, the, the real, you know, human, if you will, or, or, you know, getting beyond the liberal state and its, you know, welfare statism, statism, and these kind of things. And, you know, so, yeah, that's why I yeah, would say it's a restorative nostalgia in a way, right? Very restorative in that way. And what, what it's trying to restore is ontology. It's not trying to restore the metaphysical principles or traditions. He's trying to overcome that because he thinks that, again, once again, as I said, you know, the, the possibility in history is that now the history of being as an apocal temporality has reached the point of the fulfillment of the destiny of the West. And Hegel's absolute knowing is one of these. That's the epistemological terminus. You know, and you know, the tradition and Nietzsche, the will to power. Yeah, the will to power. Yeah. In, in yeah, the, please. In yeah, the Adorno, I'm trying, yeah. Uh, trying just to connect them up. Not to know, bring this to this. Yeah, no, it's okay. No. There's this interesting section in Lecture Five where he talks about uh, their irrationalism. Um, yes. Being, you know, sort of incorporating rationalism into the ratio, basically. Right. And and he says it's, it's a nice line. He says, and probably it is no accident, and not merely a correlation prompted by the sociology of knowledge. Um, yeah, but surely something uh, profoundly connected with the essence of the irrationalist philosophies, if they have tended uh, to be reactionary or, or uh, restorationist in character. Or, right. Uh, if for the moment I may say these words in a non derogatory sense. So he sort of understands that, like, no, yeah, this very is an much important so. element that needs yeah. to be sort of incorporated back into. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Into the I mean, really, in a way, look, I mean, again, we're reading Heidegger, and this is extremely important, yeah. but Adorno, in terms of his position, in a way, doesn't really have nostalgia, but he is also incredibly pessimistic, mm. you know, in a way. Yeah, they're, they're, for him, there's not going to be, you know, quote unquote, the overthrow of the state, right. you know, etc. You know, we're, we're really living through, I see. you know, ultimately, the Nietzschean pessimism in history, and that's what we have to think through. Mm. There was not a fondness for the, for the masses here, neither in Heidegger. Yeah. There was never a fondness in any of these people for that, in, in, in a way. It's only, I mean, really, Gramsci, the, the Leninists, you know, and some of those who had some kind of, you know, relationship to that in terms of, of thought and action, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, then, of course, the Pulitzers and the, you know, the Kojevs and these, and, and, and Lukács, yeah. yeah. Although Lukács never really was, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, he had that going on, but was way, way, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Part and he's he also, spin. he's uh, part he of that spin. elite Austro-Hungarian empire, you know, very wealthy, privileged class, too. Yeah. But he did kind of, because we talked about today, Lukács right, went right. to the Soviet, I remember reading in his biography about he, um, when he was underground in 1920, 1919, right, he, right. he carried a gun. I mean, it, there was a certain visceral sense of being on right, the margins. Of course. You know, oh, like yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, you, you know, couldn't see Adorno carrying a gun. No, no, you could like, see Heidegger yeah. carrying a gun. You could see it. <laughs> 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 and maybe bigger than a gun. <laughs> <laughs> a shotgun. Yes. In the forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. <laughs> you come from my sheep? <laughs> <laughs> but Lukács did carry a gun and he was, uh, like, yes. he lived yes, like of that. Course. He, he lived in yes. basements. Yes. Sort of as, a, right. as, a, as, a, underground. as an outlaw. Yeah, yeah underground. Yeah. As the yeah. outlaw. Yeah. Yeah. And he and didn't then, mind it. He thought it was necessary. Again, that's something we're not really thinking of. Look, Heidegger to me, if we're going to maybe build on the ontic level categories, Heidegger represents 
the thinking otherwise that we desperately need. We need to step outside completely, the, you know, through working through the tradition, but step outside and develop, you know, these signposts a new way, right? We have to think of this. Is there a third way possible? What would that be based on? What categories could we take? What do we take which is living and dead in Marxism towards the future? You know, in, 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 in this way. So this, this to me is an important aspect. At the same time, you know, from you know what you say of the the uh, Lugach, what do we take of this outlaw, you know, culture, you know, that ultimately is, you know, how do you think outside legitimization and and legitimization crises and uh, legality? Why is it that everybody's not on strike right now? in terms of diminishing wages. You look at the new tax bill, this is going to kill people for the next 10 years that are salaried workers, right? Right? In, in, in many ways. So, you know, uh, th this is a very important question to ask. You know, to think otherwise, think outside, as well as to think, you know, where is that generation of outlaws? And is it's not Julian Assange. It's not, you know, the Jeremy scale. I mean, they're going, you know, I give them credit for what they do. But where is that generation that is really going to actually break the law? Where is the one that, yeah, will go against them? Actually, it's going to kill the workers after yes. 10 years. Yes, of course, even more so. Even yeah. more so. Yes. Yeah, so yes, even more so. Bizarre. And, you know, if you look back at, at the movements in this country, Negroes with guns, North Carolina, Monroe, North Carolina, Deacons for Defense in Bogalusa, Louisiana. Yeah. These are the moments that made <laughs> the government, you know, tremble. <laughs> made made a very different, uh, made the real difference in my opinion. I'm not diminishing, you know, the march on water or the march for jobs. I don't want to diminish that. But on another, if it had only been that, forget it. You know, Nixon wouldn't even have had to do affirmative action, much less, you know, other other strategies that they had to deal with this, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. So very, very important. There's no accident that the Civil Rights Bill is, is written in 64 and uh, the, the Voting Rights Bill was 65, right? No accident that this happens right after, you know, the Bogalusa, the Mississippi uh, stuff, and also, of course, what happened in Monroe, North Carolina. And I, I mean, I know some of these people are, are I mean, you know, they're, they're tough. You know, uh, yeah. you know you're gonna to you're gonna take the lunch counter. I'm gonna take the fucking lunch yeah. counter. And put, the, put the gun down. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's interesting. The, the the Nazis. You know, Foucault right. talks about this in the 79 lectures we read. Like the Nazis gave the proletarian something, right? The, the Volkswagen. Well, you read you read you know, Mein Kampf. Hitler has a plea. I'm not saying read Mein Kampf, please don't hear me that way, but, but anyway, I've read Mein Kampf. Yeah, it's not, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a good historical document. Good There's an appeal to the workers. And then the there liberals is, today, I mean, really. The neoliberals today are not even doing that. You know, That's correct. To do that. If you really think about it, Trump and Bannon are much better students of history than Clinton and those people, all those high-powered oh, yeah. Yaleys and, uh, you know, Harvard-educated people. Forget it. Forget it. They're much smarter yeah. in terms of, of, of the psychology of everyday life. Yeah. Now you got to get rid of them. I hope this place isn't bugged. It's fine. I like the photos. It's going out all over there. Don't worry about it. We're okay. We're but they're okay. just yeah, <laughs> they're, okay. they're, they're not threatened by rents. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Maybe the new rent when we get there, but we're not there yet. <laughs> That's the last thing on their mind. Is, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, something to definitely think about. What is what is the authentic today? You know, what does that mean? And also, uh, another category he's going to use, another category he's going to use is anticipatory resoluteness. This is what occurs in terms of one's relationship to temporality. One gets into another dimension of time. No more you experience time as busyness, linear temporality, you know, et cetera, and you're beginning to experience time in a very different way, and you become much more futural-oriented <coughs> instead of determined by past 
where we're trying to live in the now, now time. And we'll go back over this too, but I just want to throw out this term, anticipatory resoluteness is another thing. And, and, uh, and that's also part of the, quote, authentic self, phil philosophically uh, speaking, that uh, Josh brought up. Okay, so let, let's go down. Um, um, the possibility lo, lo, uh, at, the, at, the, at the bottom of the page of understanding the being of the being stands and falls with the secure accomplishment of the correct presentation of this being. No matter how provisional the analysis may be, it always demands the securing of the correct beginning. So we need a starting point. So here's the starting point. As a being, the starting point of the existential analytic, design always defines itself in terms of a possibility which it is. So design also means possibility being here. And that means at the same time that it somehow understands itself in its being. So two components, possibility and understanding. That is the formal meaning of the constitution of the existence of design. And formal, you know what this means, and I talked about that. I gave you a diagram about the formal and the, and the common and the transcendental phenomenological. But for the ontological interpretation of this being, this means that the problematic of its being is to be developed out of the existentiality of its existence. However, this cannot mean design is to be construed in terms of a concrete possible idea of existence. At the beginning of the analysis, design is precisely not to be interpreted in the differentiation of a particular existence. Rather, it is to be uncovered, uncovered in the, in the indifferent way in which it is initially and for the most part. So basically, in average everydayness, we live in terms of this indifferent way. Right? We live in this indifferent. Yeah. Everybody says, how are things at LIU? <laughs> That's an indifferent. <laughs> you know, we all yeah, 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 yeah. You got it? Yeah, right. <laughs> the indifference of the everydayness of design is not nothing, but rather a positive, phenomenal characteristic. All existence is how it is out of this kind of being and back into it. We call this everyday indifference of design averageness. Huh? Very, very good. Mediocrity in our language, <laughs> I think, you know. Um, you know, the, the grotesque mediocrity called Donald Trump. <laughs> that's, that's you know, Marx used that phrase. You know who he called the grotesque uh, mediocrity? Yeah. Louis the Napoleon. Louis, oh yeah. Yeah, oh, in the 18th yeah. room there. Yeah. Well, he was kind of the Donald Trump of his time. He was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was very good at rabble, getting the rabble. Mm. He was yeah. very good at rounding up the yeah. scum. Yeah. Exactly what Trump does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speak to the base. He was yeah. excellent at this. We're living through this yeah. kind of yeah. second level now of the thing. I, I, I call him President Mimeo, but I won't yeah. give you the hour and a half of Putney Slope, which I know by heart, the movie, <laughs> but, but anyway. So <laughs> the, midget, the midget is the president of the United States, although he's a smart midget. The midget's <laughs> smart in Putney Slope, too, but anyway. <laughs> so if Louis Napoleon was sparse, what's Trump? Pastiche. <laughs> yeah, we're reading a pastiche now, all the time. That's for Chris to write about in the last last section in the conclusion of her paper on the old. You got that, huh? Last section. Yeah. So we, you know, we can work with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, and because average everydayness, and I really want us to know this time. In in German, it's all Tagliktaik. He hates them. Average everydayness. Average everydayness constitutes the ontic immediacy, going back to the immediate that we were talking about in terms of the Galian dialectic here. And it was, and will be passed over again and again in the explication of Dasein. We cannot avoid it. We're all pulled down by it. You know, it's really the, the, the case, right? What is ontically nearest and familiar is ontologically the farthest. Right? Unrecognized and constantly overlooked, 
in its ontological significance. I'll spare you the Latin, but what is closer to me than myself, said St. Augustine, and must answer, Assuredly, I labor here, and I labor within myself. I have to become to myself a land of trouble in an inordinate sweat. You know, the Bishop of Hippo is a smart guy. <laughs> Certainly worth reading the, the Confessions, especially Book 10 and Book 11 on memory and time. And, you know, very, very worthwhile. You know, even though, you know, you, you know, City of God. <laughs> Confessions, yeah, he's a thousand plat, and he's a thousand plateaus too. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, early on, right? Yeah. This holds true not only for the ontic and the pre-ontological opacity of design, but to a higher degree uh, for the ontological task of not only failing, of not failing to see this being in its phenomenality, nearest kind of being, nearest kind of being, but making it accessible in its positive characteristics. Very, very, very important. Here to, you know, this explication. But the average everydayness must not be understood only as a mere aspect. In it too, and even in the mode of inauthenticity, this structure of existentiality lies a priori. In it too, design is concerned in a particular way about its being to which it is related in the mode of ever, average everydayness, if only in the mode of fleeing, and this is a good word, and of forgetting it. Fleeing and forgetting. Yep. The explication of Dasein in its average, average everydayness, however, does not just give average structures in the sense of a vague indeterminacy. What is ontically in the way of being average can very well be understood ontologically in terms, and this is interesting too, this, this in a way is a kind of, uh, I think a signaling to the left. I don't, know, I don't think he's conscious, but we get that. To, in terms of pregnant structures, which are not structurally different from the ontological determinations of an authentic being of Dasein. Okay? So that the averageness can be worked with, right? has within it embryonic, you know, possibility. Okay. So this is very important, this section. I'm, I'm reading it because it kind of sets the stage for the thematics he's going to engage. Authenticity, inauthenticity, you know, um, flight, forgetting, again, right? Uh, and, uh, and also, of course, uh, uh, averageness, everyday averageness where Dasein is thrown into a world, right? Thrown into a world, you're thrown into average everydayness, okay? All explications, top of 44, arising from an analytic or design are gained with a view towards its structure of existence. So we're actually doing a structural analysis here, you know, as I put on the diagram of the existentialia, right, right? And because these explications are defined in terms of existentiality, we shall call the, the characteristics of being of design existentials, right? So your characteristics in terms of being in the world, or as a Dasein, are really your existentials. You know, when you say my existentials are this and that, you know, not your physical characteristics, but your modes of living in the everyday world, right? These are part of your existentials, okay, right? They are to be sharply delimited from the determination of being of those beings unlike design, which we call categories. And I have that on the board, as you can see, the existentials versus the categories, so the being versus the entities, right? 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 I hope, I mean, I hope this is gonna start to help. <laughs> I mean, that's the point of, you know, mapping it a little bit, <laughs> right? Um, this expression, is taken and retained in the primary, in its primary ontological signification. As the exemplary basis of its interpretation of being, ancient ontology takes the beings which we encountered within the word noin or logos, was regarded as the manner of access to those beings. It is there that beings are encountered. The being of these beings, however, must be comprehensible, and this is interesting, in a distinctive letting be seen. A letting be seen. Don't force the sight. 
right? This is a letting be seen. Try, try to think about this too. You're kind of freeing up a horizon to let something be seen, right? In a way. Yeah. So that this being is comprehensible from the very beginning as what it is and already is in every being. In the discussion of the Logos, again the study, if you will, of beings, we have always previously addressed ourselves to being. This addressing is categoria side, categorization, the categories, right? Again, how we categorize. That means, and as I said last week, and, and Rachel remembered well, first of all, to accuse publicly, to categorize, is to accuse publicly, you know? Yeah. This is what I don't like about identity politics. It's always using categories. It doesn't really deal with the existentials. It's a, it's a problem. It's a real problem in terms of everydayness. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm white. You don't know what I am in my existential. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, you know. Anyway, I'm just I'm playing. But, but, but anyway, it's a very rich, this is a very subversive text. I mean, in this, in this context. Yeah. So you words, say if something? You're, yeah, if, you're, <laughs> yeah. if your politics are based on categorization, you're essentially not a... You're, 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 being, you're being unlike design. So you're, you're like a table. Essentially, you, you have well, categories, and, and yeah, and in other words, it's a well, form of dehumanization. Well, you've already been you are dehumanized yeah. in the sense that you're accused publicly, you're put into an accusative case, you're no longer in the genitive case. Yeah, so think about this too. See, this is where is this is Daddy Dog can take this and then start talking about language cases and all of this, which is, you know, very interesting. He'd look at the genitive, right? Well, the, the yeah, please, accusative yeah. is the yeah, yeah, object. Yeah, You're objectified. The accusative in grammar is the object yes. in grammar. Mm -hmm. yes. So you're objectified. Yes, absolutely. You are, you're categorized. You're, yeah. Right. Right. See, I know. Yeah, yeah, I see that. <laughs> categorized and perfected. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what happens in diagnostic standard manuals. See, right. You get categorized and then you're perfected. Right? Right, David? I mean that's the way the DSM three, four, five, all work. Four, five, six, seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's always worthy of deconstructing. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so let's let's go on. This letting be seen is very important. This will come back again in the later Heidegger. Um, you know, that this being is comprehensible from the very beginning. Okay? So let's let's go on. This means, first of all, the accuse public to say something to someone directly and in front of everyone. So this is the public sphere at work, right? Al Franken did this. You know, Roy Moore did that. You know, Kevin Spacey did this. Donald Trump did that, right? Harvey Weinstein did this and that and whatever, right? Right, whatever he did. Yeah, yeah. You know, since we're in his neighborhood, right? James Toback, another neighborhood guy. Right, and anyway, used ontologically, the term means to say something to a being, so to speak, right in the face, to say what is all, always already in, is as a being. That is, to let it be seen for everyone in its being. What is caught sight in such scene, and what becomes visible, are the categorian, right? It becomes visible, what you are. Right? This includes the a priori determinations of the beings, which can be addressed and spoken about in the Logos in different ways. So existentials and categories are the two fundamental possibilities of the characteristics of being. So I have it up there, the characteristics of the little, law, lowercase, the entities and the being. You have the existentials and the categories, right? Question yeah, yeah, sure. No, so no problem. <coughs> in some... Um, yeah. These was, are the terms of the inquiry. Yeah, I was briefly okay? looking at the I'm other... trying to give you a sense of yeah. the yeah, yeah. I was briefly looking at the other translation, and they differentiate between being with a lower B and being with an uppercase B. It's the same thing. That is it just doing to clarify it. visually? Like oh, the well, being no, being? the being uppercase is the question. It's no, still the... It's in the context of, you know, for example, here when, when we read the being of being. Right. In the other translation, I think it's the being of being, but one of the beings is capitalized. So that's just yes. for visual differentiation because it's the same word? Is that the reason? What, what, what no, uh, I think he's tra they're, they're translating being for Zion. They're tra translating beings as Zion des, 
and then zande here is being lowercase, right? <laughs> so this is lowercase that has a who and a what, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Who or else or after what? Beings are a who. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. The being which corresponds to them requires different ways of primary interrogation. Beings are a who, an existence or else a what, an objective presence in the broadest sense. It is only in terms of the clarified horizon of the question of being that we can keep, treat this connection between the mo two modes of the characteristics of being. So this is all requiring this object of inquiry, a horizon. And the horizon, of course, is temporality. Okay. It was intimated in the introduction yeah, let, let's just get through this up to the next uh, chapter and then we'll, we'll talk. It was intimated in the introduction that a task is further in the existential analytic of design, a task whose urgency is hardly less than that of the question of being itself. The exposition of the a priori, which must be visible if the question, what is human being, is to be discussed philosophically. The existential analytic is prior to any psychology, any anthropology, and especially biology, by <laughs> being delimited from these possible investigations of Dasein, the theme of the analytic can be more sharply defined. Its necessity can this at the same time be more demonstrated incisively. So again, ontology, then history, <laughs> And then the rest. So this is right? why the na national socialism didn't, just, <coughs> didn't unfold in its potential because they went down the route of the biological. This is why you cannot say that Heidegger was a Nazi exactly. outright. He did about not the have biological yeah. racism yeah. yeah. at work or determinism at work. That ideology never worked. And, and if people would take that up, which Derrida does in a minimal sense, but I mean in a really good, coherent, <laughs> you know, descriptive and investigative, <laughs> you know essay, right, you would, you would put the question, you know, for me, this is a very tiresome thing, the Black Notebooks, the Victor Farias book, the, the Emmanuel Faye from France who's made a whole career, he's like a Heidegger hunter, you know how the Nazi, you know, he's a Heidegger hunter, this is what he does, this is his whole career, you ever seen this guy, you should YouTube him, Emmanuel Faye. he's got like the colored hair and you know, it's like what Tofour did he go to the day before? And you know, I mean, you know, he's made a whole career. He's the big gun on all of this. And people actually take it very, very seriously. For me, he's much too important of a, a thinker to be, de you know, degraded or to be put into that kind of uh, attack, right? Right? In many ways. Just like, you know, you're going to tell me, okay, so Marx wasn't a good father. What does that mean? You know, look how these people live. And then they're going to dream of this communist society, you know. He couldn't feed his children. He couldn't put food on them. You know, this is the kind of nonsense in some ways. I like the way Heidegger would teach Aristotle. Aristotle was born, he worked, and he died. Let's get to the work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think this is important as, as a starting point. You know, in the vernacular, that is. You know, he, he was born, he worked, and he died. Let's get to the work. Everything else is natality, mortality. Right? In between. It worked. Yeah, this was what it was about, right? <laughs> so maybe the capacity for pleasure was some secondary, uh, David. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll go back to that. I, I don't know. What, yeah. <laughs> He's not my type of guy. I mean, no. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not interested in the, the country huts and the black forest in my case. I, I like the cosmopolitan. Country <laughs> I, I think he, yeah. anything that pulled him out of himself, he didn't like. I mean, because when he really got down to writing this, being a time and philosophizing, he withdrew into himself. Well, I mean, you could say that, but he was very external in public when he had to, gave the rectoral address. You know, this oh, was yeah, the yeah, no. this was the the the, the gun of the guns of the of German uh, academic life when he was uh, going strong. So he was yeah. very much out there, out no, in the he public. Wasn't, he wasn't reclusive or, yeah. or no. you know, artistic no, no, or anything. No. He just, no. But he, he just valued being able to go inside, you know, when he needed to do his, his yes, real Yes, no, of course. Well, yeah. so did Marx at the British yeah. Museum. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, 
yeah. and Nietzsche and you know, his little right. hotel rooms all up and down. He had the best life. The Swiss and Italian borders, right? Not a bad life. Freud wakes up. I didn't know that was a brothel. Hegel too apparently spend a lot of time in brothels. Right. 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 So any 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 questions on this first section? I think it's good because it gives you a kind of overture, if you will, to what is, you know, known as the existential analytic. It gives you a kind of, the interrogator will be designed. I told you the funny story. We did this little skit in the House on American Activities with Jesse Elms, uh, uh, you know, interviewing uh, Heidegger. You know. Heidegger! Professor Heidegger, who is this Dasein? Who? Who is it? <laughs> you know, Heidegger, he's Dasein. <laughs> who? What? And you, are, yeah, you are. go back and forth, right. Jesse Elms, right. the Southern who's Senator, it, with the German peasant. You know, <laughs> who is this Dasein? What? What is this quote? Who's well, you can read this yeah. quote. You know, there was a, who's on first? No, yeah, no, no. Yeah, what's right, on second? Right, yeah. Yeah. You know, there was a, yeah. in, in the Soviet Union. There was a famous comedian who was uh, Jewish, but he had this skit. Was he was playing a Georgian uh -huh. who has a name which in Russian sounds in yours. Don't tell. So he would be like, "What's your name?" And he'd be like, "What's yours?" And and the guy's like. Uh, my name is, you know, Michael, but what's yours? And yours? And it goes up for 45 minutes. It goes crazy. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So anyway, okay, so this is, uh, this, is this, this part of it. Okay. So the next part is again, and I think this was pretty self-explanatory, I, I would suspect. How is, um, you know, the analytic of design is to be distinguished from anthropology from psychology and biology. So we begin with, you know, we must show that all previous questions and investigations, stop of 45, which aim at design, failed to see <laughs> the real philosophical problem, regardless of the factual productivity. Again, the factuals underneath the entities, yeah. right? They're yeah. factual. Yeah, go ahead, please. No, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, I find it interesting, the little footnotes, which are actually his additional thoughts, he often stresses or emphasizes things more, because in this case he says, um, uh, all, all previous questions and investigations which aim at design fail to see the real philosophical questions, but then underneath he said they did not aim at design at all. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Even posture. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's good, but yeah. it's good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. The annotations, like, like Arto, you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> the annotations there, right? right. When you get older, you write less. You know? yeah. <laughs> oh, I heard it before, you know, anyway. <laughs> anyway, okay, so let's go on. Thus, as long as they persist in this attitude, right, this is good. I mean, I love this, this tone of like, yeah. as long as you persist in this attitude, they may not claim to be able to accomplish what they are fundamentally striving for at all. In distinguishing the existential analytic from anthropology, <laughs> psychology, and biology, we shall confine ourselves to what is in principle the fundamental ontological question. Thus our distinctions will be of necessity inadequate for a theory of science simply because the scientific structure of the above mentioned disciplines, not the scientific <laughs> attitude of those who are working to further them, has today become completely questionable and needs new impulses which must arise from the ontological problematic. Mm -hmm. So this whole section is time to overthrow all these disciplines and put them back on fundamental ontological status. <coughs> Historiographically, the intention of the existential analytic can be clarified by considering Descartes, to whom one attributes the discovery of the cogito, of the cogito sum, as the point of departure for all modern philosophical questions. He invests the cogitari of the ego within certain limits, but the sum he leaves completely undiscussed. Even though it is just as primordial, this is another crucial word he's going to be using going forward, the primordial possibility, primordial being, as the cogito. Our analytic raises the ontological question of the being of the sum, of the am, I am. And only when the sum is def defined 
does the matter of the Kojitanis become <coughs> comprehensive? Right? Okay. At the same time, it is of course misleading to exemplify the intention of the analytic historiographically this way at all, in this way. One of our first tasks will be to show that the point of departure, and this is important too, for an initially given ego and subject, totally fails to see the phenomenal content of Dasein. Every idea of a subject, unless refined by a previous ontological determination of its basic structure, still posits the subjectum, the upakemion, I'm going to talk a little bit about, that's an underlying substance, the hypokemion, that is really being translated as a subjectum underneath the subject, right? Hypokemion really means underlying substance, underlying substance. Um, along with it, no matter how energetic one's ontic protestations against the substantial soul or the reification of consciousness. So he's very well aware of some of the stuff going on in terms of how consciousness has become reified. Obviously, he knows of Lukács' work, right? Yeah. This also reads very much like Adorno's this definition of the dialectic and his notion of like history and the historical, right? And how it yeah. feels. He they doesn't use those words, yeah. but it's essentially describing right. a similar, right. similar movement. I mean, look, if you're going to really try to put the two together, you would try. I think you would try to think it from the thematic of the memory of thought. This is really what a bit, you know, thought is memory, you know, in some ways, or the memory of thought, if you're going to try to put Adorno and Heidegger together and take it that way. And they do have similar kind of notions of, of history. They're certainly not developmentalists in history. They're not stage theorists in history, you know. They do have both this very vast temporality at work, you know, in Heidegger's case, Apocal. In Adorno, he's going to fight against eternal truths. Right? Yeah. yeah. So we have all this, all this going on. So yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that the more we read. Yeah. So the soul, consciousness, the spirit, and the person. All these terms name definite areas of phenomena which can be developed. But they are never used without a remarkable failure to see the need of, of requiring about the being of the being so designated. Right? So thus we are not being terminologically idiosyncratic when we avoid these terms as well as the expressions, and again for biology, life, Laban, human being, mensch, in designating the beings that, that we ourselves are. On the other hand, if we understand it correctly, in any serious and scientifically minded philosophy of life, Laban's philosophy, this expression says about as much as the botany of plants. <laughs> there lies an inexplicit tendency towards understanding the being of design. What strikes us first at all in such a philosophy, and this is its fundamental lack, is that life itself as a kind of being does not become a problem ontologically. It's interesting. And this is a, this is a, a riff, and we'll see this later, Dilfi. Delphi's Levin's philosophy, even though he's very <laughs> respectful of Delphi. So here we go. Delphi's investigations are motivated and sustained by the primordial question of life. Starting from life itself as a whole, he attempts to understand its experiences in their structural and developmental interconnections. What is philosophically relevant about his humanistic psychology is not to be feared in the fact that it is no longer oriented towards psychic elements and atoms, and no longer tries to piece together the life of the soul, but rather aims at the whole of life and gestalt. Rather, it is to be found in the fact that in the midst of all that he was, above all, on the way to the question of life, it is true that we can see here plainly the limits of his problematic and the set of concepts with which it had to be expressed. But along with Dilthai and Bergson, he adds, and he'll mention Bergson multiple times, and particularly Bergson in terms of the spatialization of time, or time as space, right? Not being as time, but time as space, in footnote, uh, 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 in section 82, long footnote. All the directions of personalism and all tendencies towards a philosophical anthropology influenced by them share these limits. Right? Share these limits. The phenomenological interpretation of personality is in principle more radical and transparent. 
not the personalism, right? But it does not reach the dimensions of the question of being and design either. Despite all their differences, and this is against psychology, obviously, despite all their differences in questioning, development, and orientation of their worldviews, the interpretations of personality found in Husserl and Shaler agree in what is negative. They no longer ask the question about the being of the person. We choose Shaler's interpretation as an example, not only because it's accessible in print, but because he explicitly emphasized the being of the person as such, and attempts it to define it by the defining the specific being of acts as opposed to everything psychically. According to Shaler, the person can never be thought of as a thing or a substance. Rather, it is the immediate co-experienced unity of experience, not just a thing merely thought behind and outside of what is immediately experienced. The person is not the thing-like substantial being, and furthermore, the being of the person cannot exist in being a subject of rational acts that have a certain lawfulness. The person is not a thing, not a subject, not an object. Here, Shaler emphasizes the same thing, which Husserl is getting at, when he requires for the unity of a person a constitution essentially different from that of the things of nature. What Shaler says of the person, he applies to acts as well. An act is never also an object, for it is the nature of the being of acts only to be experienced in the process itself and given in reflection. Acts are non-psychical. Essentially, the person exists only in carrying out intentional acts and is essentially not an object. Every psychical objectification and thus every comprehension of acts as something psychical is identical, and here we go, with depersonalization. <coughs> in any case, the person is given as the agent of intentional acts which are connected by the unity of meaning and thus psychical being has nothing to do with being a person. Acts are carried out, the person carries them out. But what is the ontological meaning of carrying out? How is this kind of being of the person to be defined in an ontological positive way? The critical question cannot stop at this. The question is about the being of the whole human being, the totality, when one is accustomed to understand it as a bodily, soul-like, spiritual unity. Body, soul, spirit may designate areas of phenomena which are thematically separable for the sake of determined investigation. Within certain limits, their ontological indeterminacy might not be so important. But in the question of the being of human being, this cannot be similarly calculated in terms of the kinds of being of body, soul, and spirit which have yet first to be defined. And even for an ontological attempt, which is to proceed in this way, some idea of the being of the whole would have to be presupposed. But what obstructs or misleads the basic question of the being design is the orientation thoroughly covered, colored by the anthropology of Nietzsche, of Christianity, and of the ancient world, whose inadequate ontological foundations, personalism, and philosophy of life also ignore. Traditional anthropology contains the following. So now he's going to take on this discipline, right? The definition of human being, rational animal, rational life. The kind of being of the, of the um, orthon, is however understood here in the sense of being present and occurring. The Logos is a higher endowment whose kind of being remains just as obscure as that of the being so pierced together, pieced together. The other guideline for the determination of the being and essence of human being is the theological one. So we have the anthropological and the, and the theological, and he goes on uh, to this too from Genesis, let's make man in our own image, he plays on the Greek here, uh, the Latin, I'm sorry. From this Christian theological anthropology, taking over from the ancient definition, gets an interpretation of the being we call human being. But just as the being of God is ontologically interpreted by means of an ancient ontology, so is the being of the finite end to an even greater extent. The Christian definition was de-theologized 
in the course of the modern period, but the idea of transcendence, that human being is something that goes beyond itself, has its roots in Christian dogma, which can hardly be said to have ever been made an ontological problem of the being of human being. This idea of transcendence, according to which the human being is no more, more than a rational being, has elaborated itself in various transformations. We can illustrate its origin with the following uh, quotations. I can't translate that from, uh, for, oh, he does. For the fact that human beings look towards God and his word clearly shows that according to his nature, he's more closer, more similar to God, somehow drawn towards God, and without doubt, everything flows solely from the fact that he is created in the image of God. That's Calvin, or, oh no, that's uh, Swingilly, right, in the earlier ones, Calvin. Um, I guess it's the same kind of uh, thing. Uh, uh, let me just look at the Latin. Uh, well, the intelligence, the prudence, your judgment, um, uh, etc. And you know, most of you know Calvin is the institutor of interest bearing loans. It's John Calvin who gives the, uh, the moral justification for interest bearing loans. Up until that time. Calvin is. Yes. I just had to throw that in. That's a little footnote number 10, you know, which is put in materialistic uh, interlude. <laughs> right. right. Okay. So the sources which are relevant for the traditional anthropology, the Greek definition, and the theological guideline indicate over and over again the attempt to determine the essence of human being and a being as the question of being has remained forgotten. It has not approached fundamental ontology. Rather, this being is understood as something self-evident in the sense of this being you know, um, present of other created things. These two guidelines intertwine in modern anthropology where the thinking thing, res cogitans, consciousness in the context of experience serve as the methodological point of departure. This is the foundation of modernity, of philosophical modernity. Same period as Galvin, you know, and others, right? But since these cogitations are also ontologically undetermined or are never inexplicitly and self-evidently taken as something given whose being is not a matter of question, the anthropological problematic <coughs> remains undetermined in its decisive <coughs> ontological foundation. So this is the reason, in some ways, in a gist, this, this little section here, these two pages, when we talk about this attack, you know, where Derrida writes the ends of man, He's actually taking his point of departure from this, right? It is an attack on philosophical anthropology. He says it's and basically humanism. metaphysical, which means yes. it's theological. Yes, right. Onto theological. Right, right. Onto theological. Right. Yes, yeah. okay. This is no less true of psychology, whose anthropological tendencies are unmistakable today. Nor can the missing ontological foundations be replaced by building anthropology and psychology into a general biology, right? In the order of personality, the science of life is rooted in the ontology of design, although not exclusively in it. <coughs> Excuse me, life has its own kind of being, but it is essentially accessible only in design. The ontology of life takes place by means of a privative interpretation. It determines what must be the case of anything like just being alive. Life is neither sheer being present nor is it designed. On the other hand, design should never be defined ontologically, <coughs> excuse me, by regarding it as life ontologically undetermined and then as something else on top of that. So the biological is never a starting point. When Stanley keeps mentioning the dialectical biology, I think dialectics more than biology. In terms of that book, you know, that he's referred to by well, Levin yeah. and Levins, right, right, because biology to Heidegger, and I'm, I'm sure for Adorno as well, is again, you know, a limited regional, you know, science, right, in, in this case, right. In suggesting that the biology, psychology all fail to give an unequivocal and ontologically adequate answer to the question of the kind of being of this being that we are, so we cannot be interrogated through the lens of anthropology, biology, or psychology. And of course we are. <laughs> yes, constantly, of course we are. Yes, indeed. Which makes it this a very subversive work, because it's undermining everything that today we take for granted, right? 
you know, the, you know, somehow we're going to discover man through study of primitive people, right? Let's go back and study this this group here. So Levi Strauss sort of fits this too in some ways, you know. In some ways, Levi Strauss is, a, you know, looking at Tristropique and his uh, study of the tribes in Brazil is actually falling, you know, into Heidegger's hands here, right? right. right. But somewhere later on, you know, he says something about the primitive uh, he cultures. Does. The primitive be peoples. Being yeah. somewhat closer to uh, yes. that sign. That yes, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, okay. So um, then the next part will be, um, um, uh, well, well, they're already always there, even when the empirical material is only collected. The fact that positivistic investigation does not see the foundations and sees them as self-evident is no proof of the fact that they do not lie at the basis of any thesis of positive science and are problematical in a more radical sense than such science can ever be. Right? So he goes, you know, he's going to go through this, you know, again, this attack on positivism, okay? So this is the primitive design, right? The difficulties of securing a natural concept of world, right? Um, I don't want to read all of it, but he goes on. Uh, up until now, page 50, our information about primitive peoples has been provided by ethnology. And ethnology already moves in certain preliminary concepts and interpretations of human being in general, beginning with the initial collection of its materials, its findings and elaborations. We do not whether, know whether commonplace psychology or even scientific psychology and sociology, which the ethnologist brings with him, offer any scientific guarantee for an adequate possibility of access, interpretation, and mediation of the phenomenon to be investigated. The situation here is the same as with the disciplines mentioned before. Ethnology itself already presupposes an adequate analytic of design as its godline. But since the positive science neither can nor should wait for the ontological work of philosophy, the continuation of research will not be accomplished as progress, but rather as the repetition you write this when you write for a grant, right? Proposal. Mm -hmm. And the ontologically more transparent purification of what has been ontically discovered. Right? Although the formal differentiation of the ontological problematic as opposed to ontic investigation may seem easy, the development and above all the approach of an existential analytic of Dasein is not without difficulties. Um, Philosophy fails again in fulfilling the task, working out the idea of a natural concept of world. And he will do this beginning in the reading for next week, start to talk about what is a world. And we'll talk about Welt, Umwelt, right, uh, in, the, in the German language. How does the world uh, uh, come, come to be? The, the wealth of knowledge in the folks far flung in manifold cultures and forms of existence today seems favorable to taking up this task in a fruitful way. But that is only an illusion. Even though we're multicultural, we live in a city of the United Nations, polyglot, a mere illusion, right? Fundamentally, this plethora of information seduces us into failing to see the real problem, right? The syncretistic, the syncretistic comparison and classification of everything does not of itself give us genuine and essential knowledge. Subjecting the manifold to tabulation does not guarantee a real understanding of what has been ordered. Rational calculation. Right? Big data. Calculated big data. Data. Yeah. and big data and of course homo data. You know, homo datum. Instead of homo fatum, right? Or amor fatum, <laughs> we have homo datum, right? Instead yeah. of homo right. data. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. So anyway. Um, the genuine principle of order is always own content, which is never found by ordering, but already presupposed in ordering, right? So again, he's attacking Descartes here in an implicit way, you know, uh, Descartes gives you order of reasons in his method. When he goes through the uh, sufficient rules of logic, Descartes says first, that would appears to me as self-evident, 
That is what is clear and distinct. Two, divide the problem into parts so they may solve it better. Three, you know, proceed from the simple to the more complex, right? <laughs> and in that, you begin to give order of reasons which are not natural order, right? Calculated order and an order that it goes through. And fourthly, be as comprehensive as homo datum in everything and enumerate everything that you could have left out. Right? This for Heidegger is wrong. <laughs> right? Thus the explicit idea of world as such is a prerequisite for the order of world images. And if world itself is constitutive design, makes for design, you need a world to have design, you're always presupposing world, and we'll talk about this because this has been taken up, I think, productively by Gayatri Spivak. World in world, you know, as a, as a term to be used in, in terms of studies, you know, and, and, and of cultures. The conceptual development of the found of, of phenomena of world requires an insight into the fundamental structures of design, which is where we're going to go. The positive characteristics and negative considerations of this chapter has the goal of leading the understanding of the basic inclination, the kinds of questions in the following interpretation onto the quote correct path. Ontology can only contribute indirectly to the furtherance of an existing positivist discipline. It has a goal of its own, provided the question of being is the spur for all scientific search and above all the, the uh, uh, acquisition of information about beings, right? So positivism, right, <laughs> right, is always looking for acquisition of information. You know, cybernetics for, for uh, uh, Heidegger is an enemy. You know, and he says this in his last interview, if anyone reads only a god can save us now, the cyber cybernetic culture is part of the en enemy. There's no thought, there's just information gathering, information uh, accumulation, etc. And as Stiegler points out, only, you know, data, uh, homo datum, <laughs> I'll use that, and, and versus that of, you know, the thinking self or the, the versus thought, right? And versus knowledge in Stiegler. We no longer know how to make, we no longer how to, you know, live. This is another this idea. Yeah, please, Sorry. yeah, I'm, I'm listening. Yeah. I'm, I'm just decide. trying to get through this as, as comprehensively as we no. can. Yeah. The idea of presupposed in ordering, is that the germ for his later concept of inframing? Yeah, in some ways, uh, what, what technology in does, technology and this is a great term he uses, the get still, right? Yeah. And this is what Althusser uses as apparatus, the framework, you know, how we're framed up in daily life, the Gestell, the Gestellung, right, is how we framed up. So everything we go through, you know, when, when Bob Dylan says the man next to me in this lonely crowd swears he's not to blame all day long, he keeps crying out, I must have been framed, that applies to all of us, we're all framed up according to Heidegger, because of the way technology has unfolded and determined us in a series of determinations. Not a determinism, but how we've been framed in these determinations by, the, the, by technology. Because technology in itself is technique and technics and not really techne, not a craft, <laughs> right? So we have lost, and this is where I think Stiegler borrows heavily from, from, from uh, from um, 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 Heidegger is that you know Stiegler will talk about we can't make anymore. Well, what Heidegger's bemoaning in some ways in this whole notion of maybe a restorative nostalgia is that we don't have techne anymore. We don't have craft, and he's not talking nostalgia just to the craft makers that make the the, the cabinets you can go Amish or oh, the chalice. Yeah, yeah. But he's, he's talking, talking about he's talking about the craft of thinking the craft of argumentation, the craft of many, many things mm -hmm. in this relationship, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. Not only the commodification of the craft, right? Yeah. But really how we make an argument, how we make something, yeah. So Techne has a very long origination. And you know, in the end, uh, I mean, uh, I say in the end, it'll go into, uh, I'm going to try to save paper because we're running out. <laughs> this is an opposition, the techne, 
Well, I'm sorry. Yeah. We're done. We're not running out of. Oh, we're not. Just keep on. Yeah. Just keep riding. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> poian, or it looks like this. Uh, poian, right in the Greek. The poetry and techne become a kind of opposition that's going on, but a very productive tension. You know, where one's not negating the other, but they're in tension going forward. So Heidegger has this, and he points towards this, and it's interesting that Heidegger, Adorno, and, and Lukács always, and they end up sort of in the same boat, <laughs> yeah. if you will, at, towards the end. It's really in the aesthetic, mm -hmm. right? They really end up, one with the poetic, right? And the origin, the worst form of the work of art. Adorno with the aesthetic theory, of which, you know, and I just found a very nice letter he had, they wrote to Beckett, Beckett and him had a nice conversation. Uh, during the sixties, <laughs> you, you, you're amazed, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I was thinking he wrote a recommendation for Angela Davis too. He did write a recommendation. Yeah. yeah. She didn't get the job. Because <laughs> she wrote the letter. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Teddy. No. <laughs> she went on the. So so anyway, yeah. yeah yeah. So anyway, this this becomes a kind of tension that he you know he's going to go. So the restore again is to go back to the word, the word, what it really meant in its context. You know, again, we have forgotten the word techne, ending, right? This, this is what the question concerning technology, vis-a-vis -vis your own, you know, yes. your own interest, is really about. Because what what has happened is this end framing. You know, it we're actually basically ensnared, right? This is in being in time. We are ensnared beings. Once we're thrown, we're ensnared in every, average everydayness. We're in caught in this, you know, kind of like, yeah, we're almost foreclosed. Yeah, see, and, and that's a good word because that's a Lacanian word, to my mind, you know, that comes up that you have a kind of foreclosure already that the possibility is not there, right? <laughs> Right? So what Heidegger's trying to do is, is break open that foreclosure, if you want to use more materialistic language such as that, right? To get away from this this um, you know this foreclosure of possibilities, to open that back up again, right? And to get us out of this ensnaredness. This happens at least in the time of the philosophy of subjectivity or in the philosophy of the subject, as, which being in time is, is through anticipatory resoluteness which puts us into a new temporal dimension, right? Into a new time. We no longer experience time as linear or as the time of the public self or the time of the outside. We begin to experience time interiorly, right? In terms of constituting objects in the world in a much more different way. No longer as now points, no longer as where space becomes time, as in the Bergsonian, we shake off what he calls the vulgar concept of time. This is a new horizon we work under, in, in, in a sense. He's going to, we're going to shake this out of our time. We're, the solicitude, if you will, you know, it means we shake it up. You know, you solicit, you shake it, something up. Not the lethal definition, you know, but solitari really means to shake something, something up, to, to solicit. Uh, so, so um, anyway, yeah, so we're in framed, and when Althusser begins to talk about the ideological state apparatuses, just to work with this a little bit, and when the French use apparatis, apparatuses, and Foucault tries to deviate from this with the dispositif, right, this is all coming out of Gestell. <laughs> you know, it's coming out of his notion of the frame and being framed up. And the best sociologist, Sean probably knows, is Irving Goffman's, you know, work on frame analysis mm -hmm. and the presentation of self in everyday life. Goffman was one of the few, you know, sociologists who took this up in terms of authenticity. He used Sartre, bad faith and good faith. This is the Sartrean language for authenticity. And, and uh, so the waiter in the cafe is in bad faith. He's just not really a waiter. He's just going through the motions. He's really a singer or he's really an actress. And I'm just doing this because it's my job. You're never really that waiter in the cafe. So you're living in this world of self-deception. Of course you're the damn waiter in the cafe. That's what you are in the present tense. That's how you're making your living, etc. And it's part of your identity. Why is it being denied? Right? It's part of the Dasein, you know, in a certain way. 
You know, but, yeah, in a way. It might not be your innermost possibility. Let's hope not. But on the other hand, you know, for some people, they make a very good wage. If you're a head waiter in Midtown, you're going to make $150,000, $200,000 a year. And then, and then there's going to be some billionaire that passes you, you know, a big check at Christmas for always having the right table. I went to school with a guy whose father was one of those waiters. The Rockefeller gave him a check every year at Christmas for fifty thousand bucks. Yeah, the wrong business is worth fifty thousand. The waitress that got the did. tip the other day, what was it? Five thousand dollar tip. Jesus saves, or I don't know. Oh, did well, you, did I never get that? one like that. No. She got a five thousand dollar tip from an organization that just randomly gives. Like God says, there's no charity, no such um, thing. So look, Heidegger is saying we yeah, can yeah. transcend in framing, but then doesn't doesn't that. Uh, what if, isn't couldn't Heidegger, Heidegger himself be in frame? I mean, how? Please, Heidegger. Heidegger. He's writing this. Heidegger, the book I'm reading. <laughs> you know, I don't know what you're really trying to get to. Well, yes, of course. I mean, you know, I mean, this is coming from a, you know, a proper we name, can name Martin the Heidegger. We framing process, yeah. but not necessarily via technology, right? Because well, I mean, no, technology for Heidegger releases ultimately, and I think this is where Stiegler wants to go. I mean, I'm, I've thought about this for a, a long time now. In the revealing. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the technology ultimately will unconceal its liberating potential. You know, it ultimately will show how it can really liberate the human. Now, Marcu Marcusa takes up that theme in one-dimensional map. It's a very optimistic book in terms of technology. Very optimistic. And Adam was part of the reason he had a, a very good reputation, you know, <laughs> with the, the young people during that time and Adorno not so much. Right? <laughs> So instead of technology yeah. ensnaring us and AI taking No, it's not technology. Mind. We're ensnared by our thrownness in the world. Thrownness. We're ens ensnared by the Gewurtheit. We become ensnared in average, average everydayness. Our task, right, in this average, average everydayness, on the optical levels, right, in, in terms of how we use things such as categories, sticking to the facts, all these kind of things as entities, is also to become interrogators, right, ask the question, the ontological question, of the meaning of being, again, this is the early Heidegger at work, right, right, the meaning of being, you know, we have forgotten the question to get away from the forgetfulness and to understand what we flee from, what we're in flight from, right? And at the basis of all of this, at least in terms of a, a, a you know, our lack of, I mean, you know, whatever, anxiety. There's always anxiety because that ensnareness is a being towards death, right? And we, we are resistant to that moment. We deny it. This is our massive denial. This is what produces, in my opinion, massive consumer society, is the denial of death. You know, the disavowal, disavowal, you know you're doing it. We really have a disavowal of death. We don't deny it so much. I mean, you'd have to rewrite uh, Becker's book, The Denial of Death, as the disavowal of death, because in disavowal, you know you're doing it, but you still do it. The disavowal versus the outright denial. This is a Freudian you know, distinction that's made and, you know, played upon. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not the so, same, and it's not the same as addiction, right? <coughs> d d denial, denial, disavowal. Well, denial, disavowal. denial in, in terms of addict addiction is uh, is uh, just a massive outright, you know. It's uh, just one uh, Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, you just, I can't, can't face it. You're, you're totally in flight, mm. right, with this. You're totally it's the extreme example of, of this. Of this. Well, the addictogenic right. society that you know some people talk about, you know, that's a term that's out there as well. You know, since we're going into terms, and these are descriptive, you know, these are descriptive symptomatic terms, right? Because what we're really getting here is we're getting a diagnosis. We're not really getting a prescription. We're in right. in these seminar. I mean, in these class, whatever you want to call these things, <laughs> these these small little uh, happenings, if you will, whatever. We we we're trying to look at you know we're looking we're looking at tests that are diagnosing the situation extremely well, and we're looking in a way what kind of prescriptions <laughs> we could take for the left or for you know our our purposes for radical purposes. How does this feed? either the radical imagination, how does it give us a new sense of praxis, how does it, you know, do these, these kind of things for us, or 
you know, to develop our own. I mean, you know, a, a part of an Adornian praxis would be to write, right? To, to write, you know, critically in a different way, in a different level. This is one thing, too. I don't, I don't think we're going to bust down, you know, the barricades tomorrow. You know, we don't, we don't have the muscle. Right? So, you know, in this war of position, how do you make this war of position with better ammunition? So this is a book that's really diagnostic, you know, of, of what, what's coming down in 1927. Right? Yeah, in many ways. It's also an engagement. I mean, it's operative on many levels. It's also operative on the level of, you know, a retrieving of philosophy, you know, not, not so that we need philosophy so that we don't become stupid. Right, as Adorno says in the first lecture. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. No, what was Heidegger uh, during the, the revolution in Germany? Where was he? He was yeah. in probably, uh, he was in school. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you mean what, which revolution? The, 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 the end of World War II. Bavarian, 19. Yeah, yeah, no, he was in school. He was he was thinking about Aristotle then. Yeah. He was uh, he was writing about Aristotle. He's in his 20s, mm -hmm. early 20s. Yeah, it, I don't think he was really politically active uh, during that, that period in between the wars. I don't think he really knew of those kind of movements either. You know, he was not a student in Berlin or in Hamburg or in Munich, right? That's another thing too. You have to think of the German university system and the geography. Because there's Marburg and Freiburg and then there's Bonn, Berlin, Hamburg, Frankfurt, and, and then, yeah, then of course Heidelberg. So yeah, he wasn't. Uh, yeah, but he was very much aware. Of the, so he asked questions yeah. like Jesse Holmes. Where were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 good, good. Yeah. <laughs> what he was aware of was the the, the uh, demoralization in the aftermath of, of, the, yes. of the war. Yes, yes. He had shell shock. No, this students. is make make Germany great again. Yeah, culturally. No question about abandoned it. students coming and you know <laughs> mostly yes. mostly women because the men had been you know killed or crippled and. Yes, um, and tremendously yeah. influenced by Junger. You know, the triad of this period of the conservative revolution, I, I mean, I, I really think that they can be read together. I mean, they're not all thinking exactly on the same wavelength, but they do kind of have this whole, these tendencies, right? Uh, uh, similar tendencies. <laughs> Ernst Junger, yeah. on pain, which has just come out about his relationship, because he thought he was in bunkers. And he survived, you know. He and he wounded. also put together wounded. and yeah, wounded, wounded, yes. And he lived to be 103. Oh, so <laughs> 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 is this? Ernst Junger. Book yeah, 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 yeah. right. of yeah, yeah. One pain. Total war. Total yeah. mobilization. He and wrote four or five novels. On the, uh, the Glass on Bees is <laughs> one very good one. Um, Storm of Steel, which I have, I have glass beads. I think there are about three or four translated into English. And of course, the great thing, and we'll, maybe we'll discuss this later, I, I don't want to jump the gun so much, but he wrote a piece with Heidegger on the line, yeah. you know, in which, you know, Junger says we're going to just cross the line, Heidegger says we must study it. <laughs> <laughs> so that might sum up what was Heidegger doing in the interwar period, you know, or in the, during the World War. He didn't want to risk his during, life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's no. a big that's difference. That's right. No, that's true. <laughs> But Junger was the, I mean, you know, in terms of the, the soldier, and you know, speaking of an argument with Marx, the worker is worth reading. That is out now too, called Dominion, is it Dominion and Work? Something like that. But in, in German it was Total Mobilization and the Worker. And Junger really saw the modern era in terms of this war machine that's going on as Total Mobilization. Beyond Blitzkrieg, beyond all the categories of World War II, he really saw you know, the new corporate warfare, you know, the economic warfare at work, you know, etc. Yeah. Control yeah. society, right? He, mean, he was uh, totally on top of this. Yeah, I mean, listen, like, people like Foucault are going through these archives just, you know, yeah. I mean, they're, they're figuring out things from these people. You know, they're studying this very actively. Just like Pasolini in, in you know, films like Salo. They, they're really trying to understand that. I just saw there are 133 fragments uh, of Pasolini that if uh, Agamben has a, a, you know, Agamben played one of the disciples in the film, The Gospel According to St. Matthew, and Pasolini's Gospel According to St. Matthew. I forgot which one, but it's a small Philip. part. Philip? I think. I'm not there was sure. an apostle named Philip? 
I don't know. I, don't know. I knew Peter and Paul. I, didn't, I know Mary was another one on the other, you know, she was the, the mother and the, and the other one. <laughs> and the other Mary. <laughs> the marginal Mary. Yeah, the mad marginal Mary. <laughs> <laughs> According to Dan Brown, the Holy Grail, she was the Holy Grail. She was, was the Holy, Holy Grail, Grail, of course. The Da Vinci Code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, was, she was present at the, uh, at the, uh, at the, the, the moment, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, just going back one second. So Althusser picks this up, right, in terms of the enframing that the state apparatus can do, right, that this ideological... So this term of inframing becomes an Althusser's vocabulary, the Marxist version, the ideological. I'm not saying that you know Althusser's not being original here, but there are tremendous elements of Gestell in the because framework is a good definition, a good working definition in English for for um, uh, the French apparatus, right? In a way. So how does the ideological, the family, inframe us? Right? How does Without the church inframe us, or the religious order, if you will? How does the school, which is the biggest battle of all, and my friend uh, Dennis Bro, who Sean knows, and I think you know, you know Dennis, uh, you know, has said that maybe the media should be included as a fourth category. I think the media is part of education, but but anyway, I don't think you need a whole new category for the media. But but still, so and how does the media? in framing happen as well. You know, why is everybody talking about, you know, what they're talking about? Yeah. So yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I've turned on TV There's last no night substance. for the first time this week, except to watch a, a, a Golden State play Boston for about <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> the other night. The subject but was yeah. the water bottle this yeah. week. The, the subject <laughs> was, no, <laughs> the, the, uh, last night is about Franken, Moore, Trump, every program on the quote liberal media, the MSNBC, 95% of the content, I didn't mute it, but I'm just looking, you can see <laughs> other people they have. They have the same characters on, I don't need to listen. You know, <laughs> the same just do the visual, I'll fill in the blanks. <laughs> you know, and, you, and it's the same cast of characters every night, too. The hairstyle and then, changes. Yeah, and, and it's you, great. Get, you get the woman <laughs> reporter from the Washington Post. The then you get the man. It's yeah, you know, every, every day, you don't have to watch V is for Vendetta. You look at the camera positions. In a yeah. film like that, which is, you know, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Is this word in framing, is it also Derrida takes up for his uh, truth in paintings about the critique of He does. He talks about the frame and the bro bro broken frame. Yes. Is it so yes, he's coming out of this too. The frame itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, Husserl used to say the museum was, you know, the phenomenological history. You know, I go to the Metropolitan and I said to my students, you know, we're here in phenomenology, the gigantic frame. We read history this way. You want a history course? Go to the museum every day. You go through each period, right? <laughs> here are texts. Here are the, you know, the visuals, right? Etc. Education is the biggest joke in this country going. And it's a huge business. Huge. Huge business. Yeah. What's that? Huge. 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 Yeah. Huge. Oh, huge. Huge. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I got to do it like that. It's huge. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 I got to get. I got to get. Uh, yeah. Got to get the French coiffures who are working on that. Right. Right. Anyway. All right. So let's go into one or two sections, and then I'll let you go. I know it's been uh, a long day with uh, two two powerful thinkers here, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Adorno and Mr. Heidegger. Anyway, the next section, uh, 12 and 13, is the sketch, right? And the sketch, uh, the, the important part of this section is really uh, the in, to be in a world. And in is really, is really crucial here. Um, he'll talk about, you know, the compound on the bottom of page 53 indicates in the very way we have coined it, that it stands for a unified phenomena. This primary datum must be seen as all. But while being in the world cannot be broken up into components that may be pieced together, this does not prevent, prevent it excuse me, from having a multiplicity of constituent structural factors. The phenomenal fact 
indicated by this expression actually gives us a threefold perspective and if we pursue it while keeping the whole phenomena in mind from the outset we have this in, in the following in the world in relation to this factor we have the task of questioning the ontological structure of world and defining the world the idea of worldliness as such so we'll be doing this next week but this is to be kept in mind the being designed as which always has being in the world as the way it is in it we are looking for what we are questioning when we ask about the who. This is the Jesse Helms question. You know, to go back. In our phenomenological demonstrations, we should be able to determine who is in the mode of the average everydayness of Dasein. And this is, this is reminiscent in some ways of uh, Gramsci's note on dialectic and language in the study of philosophy in which he says, you can really get a sense of a person's worldview by the language they're speaking. Not whether it's Finnish or Dutch or you know, <laughs> German or French, but by the use of certain terms, et cetera, and, and the, the sophisticated worldview that they have. Now, Heidegger would be against doing that through language only for worldviews, because Heidegger, again, says worldview philosophy, as you remember from the basic problems of phenomenology, is very much against the grain of the ontological investigation. But here it's interesting to determine who is in the mode, mode of the average everydayness of Dasein. Okay? And then we'll go into that in chapter 4 a little later in the discourse. Being in as such, right? The ontological constitution, and this is interesting, in-ness. In-ness. Itself is to be analyzed. Any analysis of one of these constitutive factors involves the analysis of the others, that each time seeing the whole phenomena, it is truth, true excuse me, that beings in the world is an a priori necessary constitution of design. You must be in a world before you are Dasein, right? <laughs> world is presupposed. You must be in a world, right? But it is not at all sufficient to fully to determine Dasein's being. Before we thematically indicated individually analyze the three divine, we have to orient ourselves to the towards the characteristics of the third of these constitutive factors. What does being in mean? And this whole section is devoted to being in a world, right? Okay, so he's gonna go through this. And anybody have any thoughts about this or you know, or because this is really where he goes on to facticity versus that of the factual, right? <laughs> Etc. Right? And then the founded mode of knowing the world uh, as well. So this being in a world is very important. Let me see. I think on the diagram I did something that was about about, about this that I gave you earlier. You know, let me just see. I have a sketch here. Yeah. Um, if you see in the diagram, you begin to see being in the world as attunement, befindigkeit, I mean, excuse me, bestimmung, uh, 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 attunement, that goes into throneness and facticity, right? That's one moment. Then being in, you have interpretation, the linguistic phenomena, as foreground. And then you have the project that develops out of that, being in a world in terms of a project, right? Its direction, and then circumspection in terms of sight. Being in also, you know, you're going to be seeing care as its foundation, right? In terms of care, world, and self. So I'm trying to work these triads, you know, as we get deeper into this, you know, if you, if you want to think of it this way, not as a thesis, antithesis, synthesis, mm -hmm. but as a triadic understanding, as, as, as it, lack of a better term, constructive blocks, you know. You know, it's like chords and music yeah. in, in sort of like Western sort of, <coughs> right. you know, it's like harmony. I mean, there's chordal right. progressions. Yeah. There's notes that you can modify to get a different harmony. I mean, it's, it's yes. you know. No, it's, it's, very, it's very time uh, after time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see a lot of Sun Ra here, right? I mean, no, I mean, really. Yeah. In framing, I mean. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, when you really begin to think about this in terms of the aesthetics, 
you know, what you can really do with it, you know, yeah. What does it mean to be in a world? What does that really mean? We don't, we don't speak this way. And you're, you know, we will say, you know, we say culture of something now. We're always using the word culture. That's their, their culture, that culture of, you know, programmers, or that culture of this, right? We're not saying the world of anymore. So in a way, we're, we're actually being very vague about our explication of that kind of Dasein in the, you know, being in the world. That's interesting. And this has been a term that's been very much used for 25 years. Belongs to that culture. You know, the culture of philosophy, the culture of the institution, you know, all, all these kind of things. Instead of the world and the world world. Right? We don't really speak this way. And it's kind of interesting how we're at a, you know, secondary level. We're really at second tiers here, or, you know, or really even almost tertiary phenomena by talking that way. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, this... Yeah, uh, please. I mean, I, just the, my, right. you know, kind of extrapolation <laughs> yeah, on this. You know, <laughs> you know, one of the things that's driving the right-wing movement, is, uh, well, in Europe is, as well, with them, is the threat of loss of culture. Like there's, a, there's an article in the New York Review of Books on Germany and the, the rise of the alt-right, and they said it's not economic at all, or I, no. I find that's a little overstated, but basically that it's, you know, the, 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 the call or the cry of the, the, the alt-right is we're losing our culture. In, you know, in what culture? The German, German, oh, German uh, culture. No, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Globalization, cosmopolitanism, Vol all this kind of thing, the Volkisch. Yeah. The Volkisch principle yeah. is so dominant right. in, in so many areas. Here, look, look at the uh, mayor of uh, the governor of Alabama. I know he did it, but I'm going to have to vote for him. <laughs> Democrats are He's a Republican. <laughs> the Democrats are where I can imagine when we come up with a Supreme Court justice nomination. Now we want a Republican in that seat. <laughs> right. Well, I love the Joseph and Mary. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, Joseph and Mary, right. Joseph and then the wife. Yeah. It's smearing my husband. It's smearing my husband. Right? Where do they find these Moore? people? Montgomery, Alabama. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Angela Davis from the same city. Mm. You talk about worlds. And worlds apart. Yeah, yeah Montgomery. You know, yeah. You've been there? I've been there. I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Birmingham is at least halfway sophisticated because yeah. you had a working class there in terms of the steel mines. You know, you had the steel industry yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah uh, which, what's her face? Rice. Uh, Condoleezza or Susan? Yeah, Condoleezza. She's from, she's from there? I thought she yeah. was from East Texas. No, 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 no. she's from, yeah. okay. she's from Montgomery. And the, in fact, she, her oh, family, right, and uh, 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 Davis Angela is, Davis's family knew each other. They knew each other, yeah. yeah. They, they went to different churches, I guess. Uh -huh. so, yeah, uh -huh. I don't know. Uh -huh. Maybe they went to the, yeah. No, I, I thought Condoleezza knew the families of the children. The yes, she was knew them, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The children were killed. Birmingham bombing. Yeah, the Montgomery bombing, yeah. Was it Montgomery or Birmingham? No, Birmingham Montgomery. was the bombing. Birmingham, yeah, Montgomery yeah. bus. Yeah. Bus, uh, mm -hmm. But you can see, you know, in terms of black freedom, if you really listen to Mingus carefully, especially Odes to Faubus, oh, yeah. and, you look, and you, read, and you listen to integration carefully, you really begin to see, you know, this kind of stuff at work. You know, I mean, you know, this kind of worldly world in what you're talking about, harmony, dissonance, etc. A lot of these things are here. He doesn't use this language because this is not a fit. Adorno could do that. If Adorno had had the sense to listen to avant-garde jazz, he'd have no desire. You know, it's a problem. He stopped with Glenn Miller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't he compose also? He did he compose, did. bad composer. But it was, yeah. it was not good. Alban Berg said you should focus on philosophy. Focus on philosophy <laughs> and theory. That's right. That's right. He didn't like that. He did right. work with Thomas Mann, though, on, on a musical... Yeah, I think well, he actually no. He was the he was the correspondent and the advisor to Dr. Faustus, the novel, which was the study of uh, really the combination of Nietzsche and Schoenberg, are the two composites that are used to make uh, Dr. Faustus. It's a great novel, by the way. It's really worth reading. You, unless you're diseased, you're not thinking. <laughs> you have to have disease. He injects himself with syphilis. 
in order to be, to be, to be <laughs> closer to the... <laughs> Close my God to thee. Yes, indeed. Close my God to thee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was injected. I mean, really. No, Nietzsche, yeah. Nietzsche contacted him. Yes. Uh, the, the, the normal way, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. That's a better story. A lot more for the media to work with yeah. than just injecting it. And Blake wrote a poem that, about it. That's a sick rose. So oh, rose, yes, thou yeah, art right. sick. Thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night yes. and found out thy bed of crimson joy. You got the camera on Chris? And, <laughs> does, thy, and does thy deep, now I forgot, does thy sweet life destroy? Right. Okay. <laughs> I told my students that's about syphilis. They went, what? <laughs> no, it's about a rose. Yeah, just a oh rose, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. An invisible rose yes, that flies course. in the night? I mean, come on. Frankie Lee said to Judas yeah. Free, go, look, go looking for paradise in that house across the road. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan was very good. A house is not a home. <laughs> very good. Yeah, that's a reference to a place in Chicago, actually. In Dylan, an actual uh, brothel. <laughs> anyway, all right. So, um, okay. Let me let me just a uh, couple of more things, and then I'll let you go. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so the inness. What's that, now, Rachel? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a great poem. It's William Blake. Yeah, he's nuts. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> you know who wrote a great book on William Blake? It's E.P. Dobbs. Mm. Witness, Witness to the Beast. Oh, Northrop Fry. Northrop Fry wrote a great, or even greater book, yeah. Fearful, Fearful Symmetry. Symmetry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Fearful <laughs> Symmetry. And then, and then, yes, but you know, Thompson wrote a very good Marxist interpretation of Blake. You know, Blake hated capitalism, as you know, mm. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, okay, so then uh, on the next page, what does being in mean? I'm going to read all this, but read, read this carefully for next time. I'm sure you read it already. Uh, but it, this gives a, a, a very good grammatical and syntactical analysis of what it means to be in a world, what it really means. And then being together with the world in the sense of being absorbed in the world on page 55 also very important which must be further interpreted is an existential which is grounded in being in a world right being in a world because we are concerned in these nouns with seeing a primordial structure we want to see the primordial structure of being of design in accordance with whose phenomenal content the concepts of being must be articulated because this structure is fundamentally incomprehensible in the traditional ontological categories. This being together with must also be examined more carefully so and choose the method. So yes, I guess please. this is where Adorno yeah. would have the problem with Heidegger, right? Yes. These state statements like seeing the primordial structure of being of design. Yes. Sort of, it, to him, it sounds a little bit too first, the philosophy of first, right? It's sort of this, this presuppositions that just exist because they are and to him that's make him well the pre the, yeah the presupposition here is he yes, doesn't to get like the presupposition the primordial. free floating a uh, seemingly free floating that's what he says seemingly right. because for Heidegger and them this was really you could get to close as you could to the a priori or you could get to the experiential you know, or go beyond the experiential to the primordial, at least in terms of elucidating and seeing the structure. Yeah, he thought this was a possibility. This is the violence of the Heideggerian versus, quote, maybe the more rational, you know, uh, Adorno. In the, it's in a leap case. of faith, kind of. It is <laughs> a leap, well, it's a leap, leap into the reason. abyss. Yeah. No, it's a leap to the, a leap to the Abgrund. Adorno understands the Abgrund, but is not taking it. Heidegger yeah. is, is, is kind of working from that Abgrund always. The Urgrund and the Abgrund are always what? The primal ground and the, the abyssal plane. This is where he's going in order to get to these primordial structures, right? Right? 
So, um, and it'll go through what being together with really means. There's no such a thing as being next to each other. <laughs> oh boy, you can hear him using that line, huh? <laughs> right. Going back to Han and uh, Marty, huh? Anyway, right. <laughs> of course, he uses table and chair. Yeah. You know, the table stands next to. Didn't touch that chair. To the door, and the chair touches the wall, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. Because in the last analysis, we can always find the space <laughs> between the chair and the wall by examining more closely. So anyway, being in, being with, being together with, right? And in some ways, this is again. Uh, you know, you can do a parallel reading, I think, under the general heading of a, a course, if you will, or on a, you know, on a more broader-based uh, way of approaching this, Buber, in terms of the I-you relationship, right? Instead of the I-it relationship. You know, and I don't know if you've ever read Buber, but Buber's interesting in terms of interconnections and stuff, you know, like this. I'm not, I'm not advocating for Martin Buber's politics here, but he's interested in terms of that, that relationship of the I, you, and the I, thou. And by the way, Gustav Landauer, whose name I mentioned and Stanley, you know, uh, followed up a little bit, is certainly worth reading on politics. He's a very, very imaginative anarchist, uh, you know, during the uh, this period, you know, who was assassinated, ultimately. Um, Landauer, L-A-N-D-A-U-R, not Adenauer, but Landauer, yeah, <laughs> Landauer, right. okay, so um, anyway, um, so look at this too, um, 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 directing oneself toward and grasping something, I mean the interesting thing to me here is, is Heidegger's real take on both orientation, really orientation, how we orient ourselves in the world. You know, if I, again, if I was to rewrite this, I would say orientation and time, you know, in some ways, you know, this, is, this would be a rewriting of this, or, you know, yeah. yeah. So, and then uh, next week, let's do the, um, the worldliness of the world. Let's do pay, and I'll, I'll send out an email on this. I would go up the way, all the way to, um, to, um, what did I say, 63 through 90, um, almost the whole chapter on world, chapter three, but I think I, I said, uh, 319, I thought. Yeah, was it what, till 90? 19. Section through 19, right yeah. through, completely 30, through yeah. 19, right? Oh, through 19. Or, yes. or until 19. Let me see what 19 is. Uh, the the oh yeah, yeah. Till uh, till nineteen. That's right. Up until right, right. Up until nineteen. Okay. Right, because he outlines the rest of the section there, uh, going up to the end. So what we'll do in the next two weeks? Let's just say we'll we'll do uh, finish up. Uh, we'll go to eighty eight next time, and then the week after that, if you want to go ahead, we'll do the spatiality of being in uh, and design in space. And uh, hopefully go all the way up to 127, 126, right? So that's for the next two weeks to finish all of chapter four. I mean, chapter three and chapter four, right? Okay. The they self, 111. That's a pretty easy chapter. You know, I mean, not, I'm not really easy, but it's easier. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? What happened? It's going to cut down on my Adorno time. Well, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what else to do. No, I, I, hear you. I okay. keep going on. I, mean, I, I can do both, but I'm teaching. Yeah, anyway, yeah. You're not cooking a turkey. That's true. You're right about that. You're cooking a turkey. What do you mean? What else? Have you, have you ever heard William Burroughs' Thanksgiving prayer? No. His I'm going to send it to you tonight. Thanksgiving what? Prayer. His Thanksgiving address. Oh, no. Cooking a turkey. Thing. He's very good. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> Terrifying. Have you heard it? No. You never heard it? I'll send it out to the group. It's hilarious. Oh, it's hilarious. Yeah. And here's to the suburban mothers. <laughs> <laughs> the naked dinner, huh? Oh, he's good. 
and to all of the Americans that are shitting out the chicken. Oh, oh, no. No, no, it's very good. It's very it's better good. Than it's Alice's better than Alice's restaurant. Much better than Alice's <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> so you guys are, yeah, please, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah please. Yeah, yeah. Of, uh, an what is exactly the difference? Is it captain was because it's so intimate? What is yeah, this? Is it, the, is it that the one is more active than the other? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, touch so is, is just like encounter is they're next to each other. Whereas that touch is right. That's how right. I was understanding that. Being it's probably know. more of a fusion in okay. terms of encounter, whereas the other one is more just uh, on the level of sensitivity or right. on the, the level of uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Encounter is much more intimate in that way. Oh, really? What? You think that? What? 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 I thought encounter was like. This is encounter. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you mean the encounter with objects? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I was thinking about encounter with subjects. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no. I understand. No, no. In higher the encounter is between the table and the chair. The table and the chair. Yeah, yeah. The encounter is happening. In the world of objects, this is the, rela like the, the, the relationship here. Look, I'll do this. I, 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 hear, I hear what they're saying. No, no, it's okay. The, the relationship here. I'll do it. Um, which I could just leave it up. I can see people coming. What language is this? So anyway. <laughs> This is what he's really trying to do. He's trying to break down this rest, this sense of Descartes, the extended things, the objects of the world. Descartes' major contribution, which is vast, to the history of philosophy is the discovery of the ego or the self. Right? It's a pretty major it's his discovery. Only <laughs> <laughs> it's his only contribution. He also has <laughs> another contribution. Want to make. The <laughs> object world, how we constitute the object world. So we have the thinking thing, the rags, cogitons, right? Um, right? The thinking thing, the cogitor ergo sum that Heidegger is going to turn in to an existential, you know, moment, right? Whereas the extensa is about the objects in the world, right? So in Heidegger, the encounter is taking place in the objects in the world in two different senses, the Vorhanden. The Vorhanden and the Zuma, the ready to hand and the things that are present to hand. Right? So these are the two. So the encounter is taking place through the presence of things that are ready to hand, present to us, table chair, right? And the things that are present to hand as well. So they have a presence of these objects always in the world, objectively, right? And you have those that are tools that we can use. So the encounter is on both levels, objectively with the things in the world and also the things as use. Uh, well, craft is, it may come into this in terms of how it's made, okay. yes. Yeah, but he's not doing this, he's right. doing this for the purposes of to confront the problem of objectivity at that time. So he divides objectivity into a twofold things that are ready to hand and things that are present to hand. Right? So one is presence and the other one is the use value, if you will, or the usability or the tools themselves. And the encounter is with that. Right? Right? And what you were talking about, yes, touch is much better, you know, much more intimate in a way and might be part of you could articulate the technicality. Yeah? No, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a part of the bourgeois. Yes, <laughs> was he bourgeois? Right? Or just joking. Uh, he, yeah, he's not bourgeois. Petty. That is not. Yeah, I don't know if he's petty bourgeois. <laughs> he's, he's actually a peasant. I mean, you know, like, yeah, this is the agrarian, agricultural class, <laughs> agrarian class of the period. Not the, not the, He's not a shopkeeper. His family of landowners or small landowners? No, uh, yeah. Yeah, pastors. You know, yeah, these kind were, of right. church goers. So they go back to one famous <laughs> relative in the 1600s who was a. Uh, um, 
you know, well, just a famous theologian. Of, yeah, uh, he was a friend to Luther. Or Luther? Yeah, he I had a so direct right. line to Luther. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, yeah. I have, yeah, I mean, keep it in mind too. Here he was, too, Adorno is confronting maybe some of the yeah. Lutheran translation of the Bible, right? Whereas Heidegger is trying to continue this, yeah. and Heidegger <laughs> sees the beginning of subjectivity in Luther, yeah. not in Descartes. Right? This is an interesting moment, too. And when Marcuse writes a book from Luther to Popper, he's taking up the Heideggerian problematic mm -hmm. of subjectivity to, you know, quote, the open mm -hmm. society. Yeah. So Adorno grew up in Frankfurt, right? So he's from an industrial kind of no, they're city. All very, uh, Horkheimer, yeah. Adorno, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and uh, Marcuse, and Arendt all came from extremely wealthy families, oh, yeah. very wealthy families. families. And they had yeah. money behind the Institute from Hermann Weil. Oh. who was another Jewish merchant who believed in, you know, having a, a separate institute at this time. Heidegger was much more, you know, entrapped or framed by the system. He didn't have his own institute. Yeah. 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 yeah this, this is the relative from... Uh, Stern. He looks like Heidegger. That, yeah, that's the image they're, they're, right no, there. No, there really is a yeah, quite tremendous. Like this. Uh, yeah. 1644 yeah. to 1709. Right. Right. Very austere. Right. <laughs> Santa Clara, very, you know, Santa Clara, yeah, he'll go back to logicians of Santa Clara. He'll talk about that. You're going to see Count York. You've never heard of Count York. But Count York is in this book. Logician. Wow. Yeah. Logician. Yeah. 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 It's always these logicians. <laughs> this was a time when the Turks were at the door of Vienna. Oh, the, the Battle of Vienna. Look, yeah. look, there's no accident that God was defined in the Middle Ages that that which can no, nothing higher can be proved. <laughs> God was a system of arguments, of which the highest argument would win, you know? So you had this whole, these whole strategies that were going on about this, right? About this notion in the church. Was the yeah. prime mover. In Aristotle, yes. Yeah. And Thomas Aquinas. Later, yeah. Aristotle's the inventor of the prime mover because he came up with the four causalities, which, you know, the, the, the material, the formal, the efficient cause, and then finally the teleological, no, the teleological. Efficient, and then the final cause. And then, you know, and then you have the prime mover, because he asked, what makes this all move? And he came up with the concept of the prime mover. Right? <laughs> it's good to learn these presuppositions, how these people are working, because this is what they're doing. I mean, there's a you know, tremendous amount that's behind what they're, you know, putting out, you know, what, what's being supposed and what's in the background here. Yeah. But yeah. No, I'm glad you brought that up. I forgot about this, uh, this descendant, uh, <laughs> this uh, progenitor. Yeah, kind of shaped back his, in the day. his worldview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Use the phrase. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's a very different way of reading the history of philosophy is what you're, you know, getting here too, is that this is a, a, a tremendously, you know, vivid and at the same time very originary way of, of, of doing the traditional philosophy. And you have to remember, this is someone who's reading texts and, 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 you know, basically turning them, you know, in such a way to make them speak in a different different way. This is what he's really make doing. Speak this is not make them speak German. Yeah. <laughs> the Greeks make the, make the Greeks speak German. <laughs> when my mother first heard I was reading Heidegger. They don't know anything about the Greeks, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> don't trust the Germans, Michael. She's going on and on with me. <laughs> you know, they invaded us. You know, some and people... They, and they took the gold. And they, they, they took the gold. gold. They didn't blow up the Parthenon, like, uh, put ammunition up there. Like, yeah, the like, like, the like the Turks. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Turks did. Or steal, yeah. steal the other Michael, other remember... You know, there were compounds nearby, and some of your relatives, they put dynamite and other explosives. <laughs> That's when we think about the Germans. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, good. Okay, so we'll, we'll pick up with world and worldhood, being in, being with, being with another. Uh, you know, we'll talk more about encounter, touch, intimacy. It'd be good. You know, uh, Sartre's... Um, 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 actual um, book, Nausea. He wanted to first uh, call it, um, uh, what did he want to call it? I think, yeah, Intimacy. Yeah, was what he was going to call it instead of Nausea. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, that was one of the working times. How did you get to nausea for me? <laughs> <laughs> Some of these days you'll miss me, honey. You don't know the code? The code in the book is Sophie Tucker. Some of these days you'll miss me, honey. Well, maybe you also have a problem with um, 